Satoshi released famously Satoshi released uh the Bitcoin white paper and his very first interaction was with someone that was telling him why it wouldn't work. And that is exactly what's been going on uh, since the very beginning. Bitcoin just turned 15 years old. So, um, but it's the conversation has largely been around why it won't work, why it can't work, what's wrong with the idea. Um, and we tend to do that as human beings. We tend to be armchair quarterbacks, right? We let someone go out there and invent something truly uh, extraordinary. And then we sit back. It's easier for us to sit back on the sidelines and, you know, be the armchair quarterback and explain what we could have done or what we would have done because, you know, our hindsight is always 2020. So, um, so we, as Shakespeare said, all the world is a stage and what you're seeing in terms of the global politics and the global uh, pressures that are uh, surrounding um, you know, Bitcoin, Satoshi, Craig, uh, you know, the next phase of development for humanity, you're seeing uh, this, the, the, you know, the storylines of how we want to live as a society, how we want to evaluate our uh, fellow human being, our neighbors, etc., how we want to coexist with them. Um, we're seeing that play out in this grand drama of uh, the narrative around Bitcoin that truly has a capability to to provide us with a tool set that enables us to govern ourselves monetarily and as you know as a small world network as a community to evaluate information on whether it's true or not. But I liken it to Prometheus, who uh, took fire from the gods, the myth of Prometheus, who stole the fire from the gods and brought it down to humanity. Well, just like fire, you know, although at the time before fire existed, fire was this uh, revolutionary new um, new invention, I guess, or new discovery that could transform the way that our societies are built and governed. But just because it's it's new and innovative doesn't mean that you just want to take it and like set it to a, a, a dry tree, a dry tree scape, you know, and just let it run completely free. It still needs to be managed, maintained. You almost have a deeper responsibility to, uh, to ensure that it's being used properly. And, um, and so I see that Bitcoin in much the same light. Beautiful introduction, Brett. That, thank you very much. So, you know, good place for us to start is like, you know, maybe you could give us a background. Who is Brett Banafee? Sure. Yeah. So um, I am uh, Brett Banfi. I'm the he I'm the director for uh, the BSV Association for Community. And uh, previous to being the director of community for BSV, I was also uh, director of member services for a small organization, a nonprofit in Colorado called Bus to Show. Uh, we organize bus transport for uh, to and from high risk events to help reduce intoxicated driving. So one of the nice things that that prepared me for was, uh, although I was similarly a director of a community service, member services, um, you know, we were transiting people to and from, you know, the best nights of their lives, just making sure that they were getting there safely, getting home safely. Um, and you can have this idea of how things are going to go, but there's always, you know, sometimes you get a flat tire in the middle of the night. So in addition to being, you know, having a grandiose vision for how, you know, this community was going to build, communities going to self-sustain, uh, keep each other safe. Um, there's also the random things that come up uh, along the course of your, of your uh, you know, vision for that, that you need to address immediately and that oftentimes relate with a single individual's experience. So how that relates to Bitcoin is, you know, we have this vision of uh, Bitcoin being able to scale. And we have these uh, platitudes of, of what we want to see the network evolve into and to uh, to um, to take on the responsibility of. But on the other side of some of that, those platitudes, we have people who oftentimes struggle to understand what is a Bitcoin address? You know, how do I send these? Did I, you know, what are my keys? Stuff like that. There's uh, people on the other side of these and um, and it's important for me not to miss the forest for the trees. We don't want to uh, to have this vision of of scaling, right? But we don't have time for the little, you know, the person that's having an issue, et cetera, right? That those to me are our opportunity to establish our values as a as an organization, as a network, 
um, and to to treat each person the same, regardless of whether they have, you know, a uh, hundred million dollars locked up or whether they have one dollar in in BSV, you know, they they have value to the network. I think the value of the network is the ability for mul a multitude of perspectives to um to be to be essentially you know in the same uh in the same pot you know so so how do we learn to live together how do we learn to um you know to uh to accept each other's lines that we don't cross you know and there's always people out there that have lines that they don't cross you you need to know how to navigate those what is important to those people and to uh and to be political in some ways about making sure that um that you're still able to be a friend of them or a neighbor to them, even if maybe you don't have the exact same perspective about, about everything in the world, you know? So, so it sounds like it's the director of community for the Bitcoin association. And, and yes. that, but you started out with a nonprofit in Colorado and then, you know, it, were there steps in between that? I heard you mention fabric as well. Was that yes. in between that? Uh, can you take, yeah. take me back a little bit about, you know, your journey? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the steps in between that would have been, uh, you know, I started to um, to to do some bartending as well, and and doing some custom contracting, and uh, and that was led up to my my uh, first job at Fabric. Yeah, so I was um, all the way up until the pandemic. I was uh, I was doing the bus driving at uh, on odds and ends, weekends, etc. And uh, and but I, but I had taken on you know like a a uh, front of house job at a local uh a local food truck park and um and then you know I was working there essentially from 4 p.m. to around midnight and uh in the morning times around 8 a.m. to around 3:30 4 4:30 4 p.m. I was doing some custom kitchen so remodeling people's bathrooms and things like that um and uh and then the pandemic hit and I was sort of asked by both jobs that I I couldn't come into work. There was, you know, people didn't want you in their home. It was still very uncertain times what was going on. So they obviously didn't want you serving food at that time. So I had this six week period where I was uh I was relieved of my responsibilities and I thought, well, when I'm well when else am I gonna have six weeks to sort of uh strap down and educate myself on on blockchain technology, on Bitcoin. And um, you know, the first introduction to Bitcoin was probably uh Connor Murray. Uh so if you don't know Bitcoin Beyond um and brilliant videos he did a video called uh oh, shoot something about uh craig wright uh you know how how i know craig wright is satoshi or the timeline the craig wright timeline that's what it was the craig wright timeline and you know my my first introduction to to uh to bsv was there was a lot of like people on the sidelines again going back to that concept people on the sidelines just slandering hearsay you know those guys they're all full of nonsense they don't know their left from their right and of course when you hear something over and over and over again even if you're a critical thinker and even if you pride yourself on really uh thinking things through logically you know it's just really natural to just like pick it up well of course like you know that these guys are probably exactly what everyone is saying however i'm still going to do the due diligence i'm still going to investigate it myself but i'm sure that i will find that they're all correct that these that this is you know uh you know all all a giant scam and and as i'm listening <laughs> to them <laughs> I'm like, which wow, part, these... which part, which part is a scam that you were at that time in your mind? That you well, were... just, just, I didn't know, you know, okay. they, they never clear clarified what part was a scam. And that was part of, <laughs> you know, that was part of what's so convincing about <laughs> You're like, well, they must be smarter than me. Right. Because they're saying this emphatically. So there has to be some reason why, you know, so, so you just sort of take it, take it, uh, sometimes, um, and uh, and say, OK, well, I'm going to investigate it myself, but, but uh, I'm going to lean towards prop most likely most likely, most likely scam. scam. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I, I need to figure out what it is. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then I'm listening to like people like Kurt and people like uh, Connor Murray and and uh, Brendan Lee. And I'm like, wow, wow, these scammers are so good that they're their really scam good sounds now. like rationality. Like, wow, <laughs> like they've they've managed to. Scamming uh, has really gotten good these days. It's very <laughs> articulate. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and and like, wow, like, yeah, like economics, like it's an economic system. Oh, that sounds like a scam to me. <laughs> like, oh, the miners are going to enforce the rules, like you know, and then oh, that's that sounds like a scam. Geez, imagine if imagine if we use proof of work to decide what we think is uh is true and not, etc. There, there had um, to have been some sort of a of a, of a background or you know experience for you to even comprehend what who, who, the handicap principle was. Isn't that what proof of work is? The handicap principle. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, so, it's I, really... But you you must have had some education to even comprehend the importance of that or how, how did you grasp it so quick yeah well this this is sound a little bit of a, I'll, I'll tell you a story hopefully hopefully uh it fits along with with this question but you know when i started uh when i was younger i had a friend of mine that was really into hip-hop dancing you know so i started break dancing when i was really young you know and you know to this day it's still something that i do like really well i spent a lot of time at it it was like what a job for me at some point you know but um but hip hop culture you know like i grew up in the suburbs of new jersey like you know and this, let's just say that hip hop culture it's not the first thing you think of when you look at me you know so <laughs> so what's funny is like you know i used to have a lot of fun with the fact that i didn't really look like i knew anything to do with uh with you know hip hop culture you know and i would go out onto the dance floors and sometimes i would really pretend like i had no idea what i was doing and you see this sometimes on youtube nowadays there's like the guy that's like the professional bodybuilder but he dresses up like you know he's in a, he's a cleaning guy in the gym and everybody's like well that guy doesn't belong here you know we're the bodybuilders we're the ones that know what's what's uh and then you know but it's proof of work he he says hey i i need to move this and like it's like a you know a 600 pound uh bar set you know and, and the cleaners telling like the the lifters like hey i gotta move this for you for a second they're like don't move it don't move it you know <laughs> and he just picks it up and walks it all the way across the room and they're like minds are blown like how does that guy do that right well it's proof of work you know so so the thing is that i had fun with as a young guy was like you know, using people's evaluations against them, you know, because, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. But really what that comes down to is, um, you know, it is uh, proof of work. Nothing about my appearance would show tell you that I have a, one clue or iota about uh, about, you know, hip hop culture and break dancing and stuff like that. But then, you know, and I would have fun with that. I would get out on the dance floor and act like I had like no idea what was going on, you know, and everyone's like, <laughs> boo get out of here you know and then i would just like you know start actually dancing and they'd be like all right our bad our bad our bad you know what you're doing you know and um and so like look but i didn't know that there that that was a thing i didn't you know i'm just a kid i'm just 18 years old i didn't know but uh but it was fun for me to use people's expectations against them and then reveal to them a truth that was deeper than the appearances i really enjoyed that and i think proof of work does that because the concept of proof of work if you think about it it's really about putting your money where your mouth is right like money in a sense that statement money where your mouth is money is a greater example of <clears throat> proof of work than your mouth right so yeah so um, take me but take yeah. me back into that like six week period you said during the pandemic where you're starting to immerse yourself into this and it sounds like you watch this video with connor murph Mur by connor murphy and yeah. or connor murray and then you know you're you're somehow Co comprehending this is it is it is it this immersion where you're like i get it now was it no that? no 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 it's like um you know the best way i can explain is have you ever played mini putt or a mini uh uh mini golf yeah miniature golf you know and the last uh the last um the last hole, the the 18th hole if you get it through like the tongue of the yes. of the yes. clown then you get the free you, you get know, the free uh, I, I don't get it in the tongue right away. You know, I'm not gifted. I'm not, I'm not brilliant, but I will sit there and try and hit it down there. <laughs> I'll go a hundred times, a thousand times if I have to, because I be, I'm a very obsessed person. So, <laughs> so did I get it all right away? No, not at all. You know, in fact, in some ways I'm very dense. I oftentimes say that I make every single mistake once. I don't care how obvious it is, you know, like I will make every single mistake once, but I'm usually pretty pretty good at once I make the mistake that not making again for me. And I think for a lot of people, maybe my generation or my age, um, you know, we really, okay, well, let me go a little bit one step back. You know, I had a lot of, um, a lot of trouble in school. You know, I wasn't the best student. A lot of times the reason why I wasn't the best student is I was being explained to, 
I was not being taught or shown how to how to deduce on my own, right? I was being told, this is what the answer to this problem is. You don't have to understand why this is the answer. You just have to know that that's the answer. And that did memorize, not- Just memorize this answer. Yeah, yeah. And so I needed to take it all apart. I needed to break it down and figure out how to put it all back together. And if I couldn't do that, and if you couldn't show me how to do it, then I was not going to accept your answer as the truth, you know, because that's just like, you know, you could tell me the sky is orange, but you know, that doesn't mean that doesn't make it so. So, um, so, and I think that that's something that we all face as we're in this pursuit of learning, you know, learning about what is proof of work? How do we evaluate truth against, uh, you know, against agendas? Because that's what we're really talking about. When we're talking about the truth, what is standing against the truth? It's it's not oftentimes not just fabrications or lies or things like this, but it's really agendas. Someone has an agenda to present me this certain information, like when I was first learning about BSV, you know, oh, that's a scam. Well, they don't want me to look into it, you know? So, so of course, if you tell people it's a scam, you're going to get a lot of people that just read the headlines and move on. That's the, that's the, that's the answer. It's a scam, you know, and it's a really great scam. Let's, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the fate of the free world. Yeah. Know, as long as you think freedom's a scam. Yeah. It's a big scam, big time scam. So, so uh, take me back to the, so you, you do this six week period and you're immersing, you're learning about the scam and then you go into uh was it getting a job at fabric? Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, I'm getting everything wrong. You know, I get it all wrong and, uh, but I try to get it wrong once. And, um, and also I, I'm, you know, I'm very tedious, you know, I, I will re re review and double check and, you know, and I'm pretty good at imagining and envisioning too. So when we're speaking, you know, or I'm, when I'm listening to someone, I, you know, I can, I can see what they're driving at, you know, pretty, pretty well. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm just, you know, computing all this, but there's certain things that I don't understand, you know, well, well, what's a hash, you know, I didn't know what a hash was. So, you know, um, well, you, you know, a lot of these things, they, they, they form these, uh, layers on each other. So in order to understand what, you know, a hash is, you have to understand, you know, what um what a data set is or something like that you know so everything sort of stacks on top of each other and so i just did a lot of work i would say probably around like a year's worth of work like a lot of people who really got deeply into this did a, a year's round of work uh on their own and uh and so um yeah but but the beginning of that you know it, i had gotten into bsv a little bit before the pandemic but the pandemic was really that moment when i had the freedom to really like instead of spending one or two hours a day at the end of the day after multiple shifts with multiple jobs, I was really able to say, okay, I'm going to spend five or six hours today really investigating a lot of this stuff, looking into Craig, right? Mm -hmm. Reading, researching the theories of Bitcoin, the learning, reading about the white paper. A lot of people that love Bitcoin that have never read the white paper, you know? So it's like, you, you know, you really have to go back to the base layers and try to build back up. And, um, and that was something that I was successful at because when I was 18 years old, I uh, took a one year vow of silence. So this is, you know, going even farther back in my history, a little bit more about who I am. Uh, but yeah, I, I decided that I wanted to stop speaking for a year. I was 18 years old. Moot? I had a con Moot? Moot. no speaking, no speaking whatsoever. In fact, I was on Oprah Winfrey. Was this so a religion or what was this about? No, it was Never a dream that I had. Yeah. So I had a dream. You went, and you were, yeah. went, on, you went to Oprah Winfrey? I was on Oprah's show. Yes. I was on the Today Show. I was on Good Morning America. I was on MSNBC, CNN, LSD. How, how can you be on there stuff. if you're not speaking? Yeah. So what did you talk well, about? I, when I was on <laughs> Oprah, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't talking. And so they, they uh, said, well, <laughs> Well, we'll just have you on stage. You just, well, you know, we'll, we'll just, you just be s smiling while you're up there. And I thought, <laughs> okay, well, I told him and I didn't tell him because I, I had to write it down, but I said, why don't you put a laptop on my, on my lap and connect it to the big, you know, screen behind Oprah's head. And while she's asking me a question that my, my family was in the audience, you can turn to the family, ask them a question. By the time, you know, I'm done my answer, she comes back and reads my response on the, 
on the on the screen so so i did that and uh and they it, it was great i was on there for about 20 minutes or something like that and the other people that were on there were all people who made a decision in their lives to uh fundamentally change something to make a a commitment or to to take on a powerful intention mm. okay so that was uh that was your past where you were uh uh like a mime, I guess, of mime. Uh, you yeah. Know, they, don't, they don't talk for a year. Yeah. But what I mm -hmm. guess what I was getting at was that, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> during that silence, yeah. you know, what you, you're alone with your own thoughts, you know? So, so uh, you, you tend to challenge them pretty deeply because you're like, well, you know, I just, this is the way it is. It's just, it's just the way it's always been. Don't ask why, you know? And like, but like, as you sit there with that, you know, you start to say, okay, well, what if I do challenge these things that are unchallengeable? You know, what, what, what if I start taking them apart and really breaking them down? So the point was that I got good at taking my beliefs that I had sort of taken as givens, you know, and I sort of like undo them. Like what value does this serve me anymore in my life? Because a lot of times these things that we think are true about ourselves, like, oh, I'm just a shy person. You know, uh, I'm just shy. Don't ask me why. It's just how I am. Right. But that's sometimes a decision that we make about ourselves when we're four or five and we don't want to go talk to a group of kids that's on the playground. You know, that might not have anything to do with us anymore and it, and it might not serve us or bring us any value anymore. So the idea is that we can take these these things that we think are truth about ourselves. Right. And we can really sort of uh, break them down and get to a square uh, more of a, a square foundation for understanding ourselves. And then from that, we can really build up. When we found find a real foundation, we start building up on that instead of building on sand. But yeah, so that, that was sort of leading me into the person who I was when I got involved with Fabric. And basically what I did was I just wrote them a cold email. I told them the story about that I just told you about my year valve silence, how it uh, you know helps break me down, it, uh, makes me, helps me evaluate things differently, information differently, because I've really gone through a lot of my own thought processes that I can get them out of the way. And I can try to really see what's there as opposed to sort of fill it up with what I think it is. And, um, and she, whatever it was about that cold call email, uh, the person who uh, responded to me, Karen Wendell, and you can look up on CoinGeek, New York, I think 2021. She still gives one of the greatest speeches about Bitcoin I've ever heard. Wonderful person. I still have a very friendly relationship with her. Um, Karen Wendell and, uh, and she, she reached out to me and said, she'd love to have me join her team. So that's what I did. I joined the team. I started cold calling, uh, you know, different, um, different institutional outfits and introducing them to, to Bitcoin as a technology layer. And I'm wow. still doing that today. <laughs> Fascinating. Okay. So, you know, is it correct to assume that it was a, it was after BSV came into existence that you discovered Bitcoin? Yeah, it is correct. Yeah, that is very correct. I didn't learn really about BSV. And when I first found out about Bitcoin, you know, and I Googled it and looked it up on a whatever, one of those normie exchanges, I saw that there was, you know, other tickers for Bitcoin. And I was like, these scammers, I can't believe they're trying to to build off of Bitcoin's good name. Obviously, the one that's worth the most must be the real one. Like, it's like such a like natural thing to think, you know, and uh and then like, but as I got, you know, the slices, you got to, you got to, you know, like an onion, you got to peel the layers really to evaluate and challenge some of those beliefs. Like, but, but why is the one that's worth the most? Why should that be considered the the real one? What is, what, you know, what if it's massively changed what it's uh, capable of, how it does it, how it processes transactions, the topology of the network? What if, what if the one that is the authentic one, what if that is the one that everybody's overlooking, right? Because it's on, it's an uncomfortable uh, truth. You know, we don't want to see the way things are. We want to see the way that we want them to be. And, and a lot of times the way we want them to be is that you just buy a little bit, you wait for it to go up in price, and then you sell it and you become a millionaire. That's what its value is, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, buy low, so you sell have to high. challenge you'll, that. Yeah. Buy low, way. sell high though. <laughs> it, it does something different. Jeez, <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> All right. So perhaps a, a good place to go into now would be like, uh, helping better understand, like what is decentralized versus distributed? Yeah. That is a really, uh, confusing 
something you talked about that before in that interview with Bruce and what is the difference between those two things? Yeah. Maybe- yeah. So, and, and I'll talk, I'll, um, I'll use an example of a, of a researcher that I really love. His name is Ken Wilbur and, you know, Ken Wilbur talks a lot about this concept of the web of life, you know? So uh, you have this, you know, like um, critique of, uh, of, you know, postmodernism, so to speak, um, that looks at, you know, first of all, there's some things that are wrong about a modern way of looking at the world, right? Maybe the modern, the modernist point of view comes into being like, you know, around like the early 1900s or something like that, that, you know, really, uh, really, um, take say you know like it's it's sort of a little bit tied to like materialism or something like that you know atomism within science you know even behaviorism within psychology the fact that we can you know look at things and sort of generally get their um their qualia and their qualities and their essences based on what we can observe because the only experience the only universe that we can measure is the universe of physical things right so we have to we have to you know so this is the idea that maybe like you know if i had a perfect ekg of your brain and i could see every neuron and every you know the the molecular compounds that are all exchanging etc i could have access to your inner thoughts you know because in a way you know the thoughts are just this uh composition that's being we think that it's thoughts but it's really this uh this deep composition of of the material elements of ourselves because that's really what's real in the world and um and so i i got drawn to this guy again through that year of silence uh, i i found a lot of you know uh value out of what he was explaining and some of the some of what he was explaining was the way in which you uh, take this concept of this like interconnected network of surfaces and you can uh, and you can imagine that it can somehow reconstitute the uh, the elements of interiority. So, you know, it's the same concept of, you know, I look at all of your neurons, I understand where all your chemicals are, whatever. And it's the way in which they all interact that produces this hallucination that you experience that is like your sense of self or your your inner thought process etc but that in reality that that is just being uh being sort of like produced as an illusion by these all these various different interconnecting uh exteriors and and when i think of that you know he he has a deep critique on that philosophy and his um what he tries to reincorporate is this concept of like a deep science that takes like the best of mysticism, Eastern mysticism, Eastern philosophy that really understands like Tibetan wisdom and, you know, the concept of like, uh, you know, uh, you know, deep prayerful states, things like that, that can get you up out of the physical realm into this, you know, more of an ethereal plane or more of a direct connection, oneness with God, et cetera, you know, um, and really, uh, incorporate that because the concept is that that's sort of like when you start talking about that stuff you're taking like you know a left turn away from science right because they're like well we don't got science you know god does science doesn't know how to quantify god so for us we just leave that part out right and we just got to focus on what are the things that we can quantify whereas God and this concept of consciousness and a lot of this stuff, right? This is really stuff that you don't quantify, right? You qualify it, right? And so um, so it's this conflict between the instinct in us to quantify versus the instinct in us to qualify. And um, and so, you know, the this to take that back to this concept of decentralization and distributed consensus, right? Well, first of all, the first thing you have to understand is that in order to have something like a distributed consensus, right, you have to have individual agents on the network that are, have agency, right? They have to have free will, right? Because if like at the end of the day, we just, you know, to take it back to, you know, the concept of being told something when you're in school, you know, if, uh, if the teacher just says that an apple is blue and, you know, the sky is red, right, and we all just assume that truth, right, then there's – then none of us have any agency, you know, so, so – uh, we're so, in a dictatorship at that point. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, we're just taking the truth that's being handed down to us and we're just disseminating it, right? And okay. we're just 
uh, we're just regurgitating it, so to speak. So, so we have to, so, and, and there, there's no agency, at least when it comes to the discovery of reality within those students, right? Because you can't, you can't step outside of the teacher's perspective or else you'll get an F or something like that. Right. So, so when we're talking about distributed consensus, the first thing that we have to understand is that these are age uh, agents uh, that, that possess agency. They act in their own self-interest. They act in their own, um, you know, uh, best interest. And, and, uh, and so there's also this concept of like, well, it, it's very dangerous that if you act too much in your self-interest, because, you know, like you're, you know, like, well, and there are, there are honest, you know, truths to that, because like, I'm standing at the line in the supermarket, and I realize I accidentally forgot my wallet, you know, I don't turn around to you and club you over the head and take your wallet, even though in my best interest, <laughs> technically, like, I don't want to go back to my house and get my wallet, I want to, you know, so so like, you know, there's, there's some truth to the idea that acting in your own best interest, you know, uh, if you do it in an exclusory way, or if you do it in a completely blinded way that there's that that uh, represents some sort of threats, right? So we need to, we need to, um to evaluate and acknowledge them. And we understand those basically to be like, kind of the, the basically the, you know, the, the, um, the, um, you know, the thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not, you know, steal. Yeah. Those are the repercussions of, of our actions. We, exactly. We, we understand that. So now how, yeah. how does that relate to the distributed versus de decentralized, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, or, or so differences are. yeah. So with, with uh, now, this is just my own personal take and maybe it's not even the uh, official take. Like, you know, I try to really use Craig as a sounding board on a lot of my ideas and stuff, but I would say maybe even, I don't have the exact same view on on uh, this as Craig, or maybe we use different semantics or something like that. Uh, so it's an area that I'm going to continue to challenge to see if I can understand it better. Um, but uh, but you know, with a distributed model, you really have this concept of again, like we go back to the concept of the Byzantine generals problem, mm -hmm. right? These are. Um, yeah. These are, you know, these are various different generals. Like we just imagined. Yeah. Oh, I, I, pardon my interruption. I, I, yeah. I actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to consider about asking about that. And that's like going back to the proof of work and the, you know, the handicap principle. So go continue. We, what is this Byzantine general problem? It's in the white paper. Isn't that right? Yeah. Well, it, the, it's not okay. necessarily in the white paper, but it's the double spending problem. So I guess in a way it is in the white paper, but it's another name for the double spending problem. Okay. So the double, the, which, which in simple terms means like, you know, how do we make sure that money wasn't already spent exactly on, on the network? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's the main and the and before I get into that, let's just say that uh, it's the same problem that they face at the bank. So if I go to, um, you know, let's just say that uh, I, I buy some supplies from you and I buy some supplies from your neighbor. OK. And I have one hundred dollars in my account and I give both of you a check for one hundred dollars, but I only have one hundred dollars in my account. Right. So both of you, you don't know about the other one. The other one doesn't know about you, but you're both in need of the money. So you head to the bank, both of you approximately the same time, right? You walk up in line and, you know, you're like you're both on different sides of the tellers. One's dealing with this one, one's dealing with this one. You know, you hand your checks in, right? Whose check gets there first, you know, because whosever check gets there first, they're getting the hundred dollars. The other person's going to get a little letter that says, you got to go back to the guy that gave this to you. He's a bum, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, um, so, but the, the nice part is that the, with this, how this gets solved in the world of the bank is that the bank is the single arbiter, right? If we go back to the teacher, telling us what's uh, whether the apple is red or blue you know the bank is telling you which one came in first right maybe the other one came in first but the teller was a little bit li like slow dropping it in the, in the slot or something and 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 so but it doesn't matter which one actually came in first because what matters is which one the bank says came in first you know um but that changes when we're using a model such as Nakamoto consensus, which Bitcoin uses, uh, BSV, which ex which examines how do we determine when there isn't a single uh, authoritative perspective, but there's multiple different perspectives, right? And so what I was getting at is that the first thing that we have to understand is let's just say that there's five perspectives, right, on the network, because sometimes it's easier to like uh, to use smaller term to use a smaller concept. Right. So there's five different people on the network or there's five different views on the network. Right. That are all like basically voting on which 
uh, check went in first, right? But uh, what if I've managed to sort of like convince some of the people on the network, like, hey, if you tell them that this one went in first, you know, which is maybe it's me spending to myself or something like that, you know, then I'll give you, I'll cut you in on the uh, the result of that, right? So how do we know that they're, uh, when they say that this one came in first, how do we know that it's, you know, as they say, it's, and Daniel Krawitz, who where the handicap principal link comes from, you know, he says it's a, um, oh, shoot, now I kind of forget the, the word for it, but it is a, uh, it's a network in which uh, the there's there's uh, conflicting views. Oftentimes, these views are going to be competing against each other. There's a word for it that that's escaping me right now, but um, but uh, but yeah, that that's the idea. Is that you know, it's not a homogenized network. That's like, for example, all managed by one individual that all has the you know same perspective. Um, so we need a method by which we can uh, we can allow for this information to be shared publicly in such a way as uh, the complications that arise from that, first of all, are mitigated. The complications that arise from, you know, multiple different narratives, multiple different perspectives. Um, because if we have five different views of the network, right, the five different nodes, those would be the miners, uh, then maybe they all decide a different scenario, right? They all individually decide, well, you know, well, we want, you know, they, maybe they all decide that the money goes to themselves, right? Because they're like, well, we're, we're the new Kings. We, we have the power now. So you didn't get paid anything, sir. That, that money went to me. Um, and so, so these are the, the problems that, uh, that were, they were longstanding problems in computer science. They are sometimes known as the Byzantine generals problem. They're oftentimes also known as the double spending problem. And they are the, you know, the solution was in, in, uh, existence you know so but it just hadn't really been pieced together as a single cohesive concept especially within entire network uh to to um to validate because the thing is when bitcoin was released it wasn't even clear that this solution was practical or that it was uh going to be an, a real solution as opposed to just another effort at a, a solution um and so so not just what's really interesting about this is that we're, and Daniel Krawitz, I really encourage a lot of people that are listening to go out there and listen to some of Daniel's videos on YouTube because he does such a great exp a job explaining this. One of the things he says is that, yes, we're talking about things like, you know, the bank and the one hundred dollar check. Right. We're using these hypotheticals to examine these things. But. It's not just that we're examining this particular use case, but we're also talking about it extends to our overall global uh, order, our overall global culture, our society. How do we decide what laws to live by? How do we decide that uh, that we want to drive on the left side of the road as opposed to the right side of the road, right? And how do we ensure that uh, that we are able to do so in a way that preserves my agency and your agency as users of the network, preserves the agency agency of the perspectives on the network that are being compensated for processing all these transactions like these these nodes they're like gerbils on a gerbil wheel i mean they're just like running as fast as they can to process you know th tens of thousands of transactions millions of transactions per second you know um how do we make sure that they have the incentive to to do all this and essentially what we're doing is we are you know we have the brilliancy of computers computers you know can compute so much and and they take so much burden off of us uh to be constantly keeping track of things if you just let the computer keep track of what it's good at we can be more free to be visionaries to go out there and say hey what i want to invent something today or i want to uh i want to come up with a new language i'll make a new language tomorrow you know we can go and do that type of stuff and maybe those set the footstones for tomorrow's world you know but we but when we're when we're like stuck in this world of trying to keep track of all this data, you know, then, then we can't do that really well. The computers are good at keeping track of it. Let them do it. But the problem is, is that if we just use one set of authoritative view on the network to keep track of all of the network's data, naturally that view becomes a uh, becomes a honeypot. People will need to get in, you get into that view. It's just like how it works with world global politics today. You know, like we have uh, one point of view for how to, uh, you know, a, a, an organization to preserve 
uh, free will or a, an organization to, pre to preserve human rights or something like that, you know? So we elevate them because they're doing a good thing. They're keeping track of human rights, right? Uh, but then at little by little, like their authoritative view across the whole globe, how to keep track of human rights across the whole globe naturally yeah, I think these people's human rights are a little more important than these people's human rights. And so you tend to see that, that, that it gets divided that way, you know, even though the goal is to preserve all rights, but what ends up happening is you have our natural biases as human beings that filter in. So, so in addition to just being this revolutionary technology to keep track of finances and to be able to send money peer to peer and to do all these things really in another deeper layer, what it's doing is it's, it's setting out the framework for how we can have a uh, a global solution to a world where agency is preserved, but is not uh, overridden by a central uh, central oh. perspective. And and that's and and the, there's two different ways to do it. There's the you know decentralized method, which is that web of life that Ken Wilber was talking about, which is where every node is sort of equal, right? We have what the what we do is we have you know like. Uh, tens of millions of nodes, right? And then we let them all uh, evaluate uh, because it's it's true. It is hard. Like if we were going to have, uh, let's just say that we live in a small town and we want to decide whether it's permissible to jaywalk or something like that. We just let all, um, you know, nodes, these the townspeople vote at all times, maybe at 3 p.m. on a school day, it's not okay to jaywalk. Maybe at uh, 3 a.m. when no one's around, it is okay, right? So, uh, and it's and it's hard to co-op co that, that's true. But at the same time, uh, by having it be, you know, all of the different uh agents on the network voting um you know and and not and that this is important not voting with proof of work right but they're just voting um you know there there's a problem with that because then at the end of the day really what you kind of get down into is like sort of like um you know you just you know i hate to use the example of american politics but like you sort of get down into this like you know lesser of two evils you divide into two factions two camps right and like you know they they just stand up, up opposite to each other and you and you evaluate people based on like well which side of this like dichotomy do you fall on do you you know are you one of these people or one of those people it's like well i'm not a, a either of those people you know like um but like you know well if you're not a either of these people then your vote is is not important because we're only voting on whether <laughs> you want the turd sandwich or the, the you know, or the, uh, you know, the, the whatever. Your vote doesn't matter then. Yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. So yeah, you either vote on one of those things or else your vote doesn't matter. And, and so, so that's sort of like not, you know, I'm using these broad that's strokes. Just so reality, at least. Yeah. Like, yeah. But that's what the, that's what it devolves into when you have nothing, when your vote isn't, isn't backed by any proof of work, right. That, you know, um, and, but when, when you have this distributed model, which it you know, the distributed model would be much more of like, you know, okay, so maybe not every single townsperson in our small town d decides on every jaywalking law for the entire town, but maybe we have like a hundred or so people that have a lot invested in the town, you know, and like, and as Craig talks about in a lot of his stuff, he says, you know, like the lemon law, like you, you know, you go to a shop, uh, that's selling a beautiful, you know, a beautiful car, sh a car showroom or whatever. You aren't concerned whether what's going to happen if the car, when it gets delivered to your driveway, doesn't drive because you just walk right back into that person's showroom and say, the car you dropped me off doesn't drive. And they have something at stake by the virtue of the fact that they have something invested in the network, which would be like their reputation, their um, their you know, their, uh, uh, profits that they're getting from, uh, from having this, this, uh, great location, et cetera, you know, they're not going to let one car ruin all that. But the, but if you, if there, you have nothing invested, right. And like, you know, so, and, and it's, there's the 10 million, uh, point perspectives, then really like it's, you're just sort of, uh, at the whim of whatever the current popular trend is. And as we know, and as my dad likes to say, the masses are the asses. So like, you know, we, uh, when you just go on based on the pure, whim of the popular opinion about things a lot of times 
these are people that are just being processed information. They're not taking time to evaluate it and they're just regurgitating it. And if someone tells them that something X, Y, or Z is good or bad for them, they aren't going to really spend a lot of time. It's just, that's what, that's what Joey said. So it's what I'm going to agree with. Got it. And so that seems like what the, the distributed version solves. It solves that by, by blending in the proof of work uh, aspect, which is yes. Not not just skin in the game. It's not like proof of stake where you're putting skin in the game, but you're actually uh, you're you're sacrificing resources. Yes. Is that the yes? You yeah. You, you're sacrificing. You're making a um a you know you're you're putting something behind your statement that is uh that you know and and this is why again we look we talk about this as being not just you know a a. Um, technology layer, but there's so much deeper that really relates to our foundations of our society, how we evaluate truth. Because, um, you know, as Daniel Krawitz, and again, you know, going back to his boost network, where, you know, he's using um, the same, the same tools that we use to, um, to publish to the, well, first of all, I, I don't want to talk past anyone when it comes to the Bitcoin network. So Bitcoin is a public network. And because it's public, uh, it means that anyone can really write to it, right? So you and me could decide that we find the next Bitcoin block and that, whoa, lo and behold, all of them belong to me. Wouldn't you know it? You know, so we publish that online. It's public, right? And other people can pay attention to us. You know, they can, they don't have to, but they are allowed to listen to us, you know? So, so, um, so, you know, one of the big nodes on the network just comes along and go, Hey guys, everybody stop what you're doing. Turns out Brett Banfi over here figured out that all the Bitcoin belonged to him. So we can all go home now, you know? Um, the, the reality is that they're not going to do that. Right. Um, so how do I signal to them? How do I get them to pay attention to that? Hey, I found some information about the Bitcoin network. You might find it relevant. Okay. Well, uh, well, first of all, they don't know whether I'm going to, you know, pull a rabbit out of my hat or really tell them a truthful, honest story about something that I found. So what we, what you use is you use the proof of work as a way to say like, okay, look, I've solved this very difficult algorithm. Uh, or in a, it's a lot of times people say it's a difficult algorithm. It's not really a difficult algorithm. It's just guessing a bunch of times, right? Like, is that so difficult? Like, have you, if you've ever like found someone's phone and wanted to call them to tell them you found their phone or something and they have the code and, and you try a couple, like, oh, I'll try zero, 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 <laughs> you know, it, it didn't work. Right. All you're doing when they're, when they use this, oh, it's a complicated algorithm. It's just brute forcing. You're just brute forcing. So it's not too much complicated about that, but, uh, but either way you, um, you should Show this effort, this work that you've done that uh, that is only possible to solve with like extraordinary amounts of guessing. So I think the Bitcoin network uh, is guessing at a rate of 400 quadrillion guesses per second or something like this. And uh, and it takes on average 10 minutes to find the solution. So you're guessing a lot. <laughs> and uh, and um, so when you find a solution, uh, it's 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 it's. Uh, it's, I guess, you know, like uncommon enough that a solution gets found out of the blue that if that by set by that you can use it to signal the network, you can use it to say like, Hey, everybody look over here. I, I do have a solution now. Now the network again, cause this is all public. So the, so the network now can look at my solution. They can evaluate it. And they just see that, oh, like he he says that all of the Bitcoin belong to him, right? So they can just ignore that, right? So I was successful at getting them to look at my information. They looked at it because I used the proof of work to to um to signal to them. But but at the same time, just because there's proof of work attached to information doesn't mean the information's correct, right? Like it could still be garbage. It can still be me just pulling a rabbit out of my hat or or telling a uh, saying a you know that I found all the Bitcoin in the world and that doesn't make it true i can still tell a lie and use proof of work to tell it but the thing is that it's just it's just that over time if i continue to do that i'll just i'll just run out of money right or i'll run out of resources so so it's like almost like in the same way that a bio a biological system will oftentimes have all the different pieces of the system i don't know if you if you remember that from when you're a kid you know and you had like kids biology and it's like the the coyote eats the deer and then poops and then the poop you know like uh like becomes a fertilizer and then the worms come through and then it goes down to like you know the, 
fish and then the fish have the algae and the algae clean the rocks and the rocks being clean gives the crayfish a nice spot to lay their eggs. And then, and the whole thing is this giant circle, right? Every single part of that is really important along the way. And, and so, so similarly, you know, you have this, uh, this system that, uh, that, that it's all sort of um, really dependent on each other. You use, uh, the proof of work to signal this. Uh, the signal indicates there's something valuable to look at, right? And and uh and but if you if you're signaling something that is that is um you know false, if you're wasting energy and resources signaling this thing that's false, it just gets left out of the network, right? Because it's just clearly clearly false. So um. So it's and and uh, I hate to use you know the concept of the human fertilization of an egg, right? But like the the network is like this egg, right? And like and there's these various different you know uh, you know sperms that are competing to fertilize this egg, you know. So uh, so it, it needs to you know you need to do the proof of work, right? Uh, to get there, but just because you get there doesn't mean that it, that it's it's necessarily going to be accepted, right? It, it only gets accepted accepted if it meets the basic parameters and and th and then that's how the the network basically cleans itself and takes care of itself right is that it's continually referencing back the original uh concept the original protocol for bitcoin you know these are how coins get spent this is how uh we validate this is how we communicate with each other you know these these types of things and then you know and, and there I hate to like really drag on to maybe this is an esoteric concept. So hopefully I haven't lost anyone in this, but you know, this is a really uh, something that I go back to a lot of times when I'm in discussions with different people with conflicting views about Bitcoin uh, because, you know, pr Satoshi was very clear that just proof of work was not enough to uh, subvert the network. Right. Because at the end of the day, if, uh, Imagine that, you know, imagine that we only used proof of work to evaluate whether something was true and we didn't evaluate whether or not it fit those parameters of the egg like we were talking about before, right? If we did that, then then we, you know, whoever has the majority hash network or let's say me and you are minority ourselves, but we each have about 30%. So combined our 30 equals 60%. We have a majority of the network. And then we just decide, okay, well, let's just start publishing blocks with our 60% of a hash rate that say that instead of 21 million coins, there's uh, 210 million coins. So we just instantly increase the supply and people go, oh, well, well, you can't do that. Oh, but we have the hash. So you don't get a say because we have the hash power that proves that we just inflated the the currency but it's just like you know we talked about before you go back to that the problem about the egg and the and the egg is really the sanctum of the network right that uh that that even though you have the hash and you're applying it you know you're you're not contributing anything to that cycle of life of the network right you're uh you're you're using your hash but you're using it in you're using it for basically like to to deceive you know and so and so the network even though it represents a, a minority of the hash let's say that we control 60 percent, then the rest of the network owns about 40 or has about 40 percent of the network's hash but they don't have to accept your block just because you have the most hash power right and satoshi uh, was clear about that in, I believe, section nine of the white paper calculations, because he says, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about the network being subverted because the honest nodes will never accept a invalid block. So if, if, even though we have 60% of the hash, even though we've done a ton of work, right? Um, if we say that there is now 210 million coins on the network, right? That That's an invalid block. It's not invalid because the work- What makes it invalid? Because the- yeah, it's a good question. What makes it invalid? I don't, uh, I know that the, the, the reason why I'm saying it's a good question is because a lot of times people conflate the protocol with the white paper, et cetera, you know, and the white paper doesn't mention anything as far as I know about how many uh, coins are in, uh, are, are in Bitcoin, right? The, the, you would have to examine the code to see mm. that there's this uh, cycle, you know, for another thing, the white paper doesn't really mention, I don't think is the having cycle that it, it halves over X numbers of, of blocks, et cetera. So, so it's not really, you know, it's, it's again, like the white paper is like a Rosetta stone, right? Like, 
if you've ever used a Ouija board or something like that, where like, you know, you, you can use the white paper, but it's not the white paper alone, right? It's in the white paper in tandem with the code. Um, and, and in some respects in tandem with some of the original writings of Satoshi, because, you know, um, you know, even he maybe didn't get everything right with the initial release. You know, that's why he said this is an alpha and it could get shut off and restarted at any time, you know? So by, by these two um, nodes broadcasting that there's now 210 million Mm -hmm. coins, you're Mm -hmm. saying that the, the, the miners would realize that that was invalid because that's not the, the reg, the the common protocol. Yes. Yes. It would be, um, yeah, it would be outside of the, uh, the, you know, the framework. How would, so, the mo- so, how would the miners be able to identify that? Well, it's, uh, so if, uh, you know, this is just one example, but, uh, one of the ways that these coins could be inflated would be to increase their distribution within the coin base. So when the initial block gets discovered, the node that discovers that block gets a small reward and issues th- that reward to themselves. Um, and so, like, you can imagine it like, uh, like, imagine that Bitcoin is like, you know, um, a big Mexican standoff room. There's like a, a table in the center. All the Bitcoins are in the center, you know, and when you get all the way into the inner sanctum of Bitcoin in order to be able to write a new block to the ledger, right? You just, when you leave the table, you go, okay, guys, I'm taking my my reward, which is $6.25. It's just like if you're on like camera in a casino right like okay here's the six dollars i'm walking out of the room now i'm going to leave with this money this is now mine and um but if you take more than six dollars and 25 cents you know like everyone will see you yeah we would just yeah you just get you just get ignored so so the the reality is that you still walk away with that money you can still go into the bitcoin inner sanctum room and you know, but it's digital. It's it's imaginary money. So you walk away with it, right? But where is it? Like you know, or you go, okay, well, I'm going to use this imaginary money that I just got, and I'm going to try and pay Gavin. You know, and you go, well, I don't want that. Nobody <laughs> agrees that that actually happened. In fact, we we all saw that you took <laughs> took thousands of of bitcoins when you were supposed to only take six and a quarter. So so the it's not a problem of whether you can take it. Anyone can take it. You can publish something that says I have a lot of bitcoin. The problem is, is can you get someone else to accept? it you know and uh and uh, and if they don't want then to... when you want to spend it he if he he's got a, a basically a, a transaction that is not honest it's a some sort of a uh m- you know whatever you call it you know it's made up yeah then it, yeah, then it's, it's like... not going to be accepted so it's like uh, the funny money what do they call it what do they call the money you know where you copy hundred dollar bills and you try to use them yeah uh, yeah counterfeit, counterfeit counterfeit money it would be yeah. like a, it would be like a guy who looks up in the in the register store and he looks at it and he says oh no this is a this is a yeah. oh, this is a counterfeit i, I don't yeah, have this th- yeah this it <laughs> says it's a bitcoin right because it, yeah. it has it, it it looks like a bitcoin right like but no no node on the network agrees that this is a spendable output right yeah. you're, you're trying to give me something that is that is, that is fraudulent. counterfeit it's counterfeit yeah. So, yeah, so and- no one would, even if he got it, he couldn't spend it again right. because he would try to cash it in and they'd say they'd be able to identify yeah. it. Yeah, that makes yeah. total and, sense. And and the beauty of this too, and this is this is the mind really mind blowing part, and and I geek out about this stuff. So okay, we talked about hashes, you know. So hashes are basically fingerprints of data, you know. So you have, let's just say we have like the letter A, right? And then we hash the letter A, and it gives us this, you know, long string, and it's, you know, it's uh. 32 bytes or something like that the equivalent of 256 bits which a byte is like you know a there's um you know like when you go when you go on your ms paint or something and it shows you that the uh the color that you're looking at has a uh the the number sign and then ff 00 aa or something right those are bytes so and you can use that to uh to contextualize uh, bits of information, which bits are just zeros or ones. So is this basically what it is? Is it's a a fingerprint, a long 256 bit uh, um, identifier for the the single letter A, right? And we have this other single letter B, right? And we create an identifier for that, right? And then we take the two identifiers and we create an identifier for the two identifiers, right? So they the the concept is that 
these the information funnels down into itself, right? So you have um and and the reason why I bring that up is because when we're talking about what is a valid Bitcoin and what is not a valid Bitcoin, right? What you have to say is, okay, well, why is this Bitcoin valid? Well, this Bitcoin is valid because it it's you know, it's the equivalent of the hash of the two neighbor Bitcoins and the two neighbor Bitcoins are the hashes of their neighbor Bitcoins, right? And what you do is you, and this is called the Merkel tree and I believe it was Robert Merkel and, and it's capital yeah, what is M. The Merkel, what is the Merkel tree? The it's Merkel mentioned tree. in the white paper too. Yeah, and the Merkle tree, one of the things that's interesting about the Merkle tree is that it by using this Merkle tree, you actually get rid of some of the security of Bitcoin. So it takes like one bit of security away because you uh, um you uh you you ha have to hash the um the the uh product multiple times. And when you hash it the second time, you get a D an a increased chance of a collision between the hashes. And I'm not like um, a crypt cryptography expert or anything like this. This is just the best that I, that I uh, understand it. But um, the idea is that, um, that, you know, you, hmm. you can take the, the information. So like, for example, why is a Bitcoin spendable? Well, a Bitcoin is spendable because it comes from an original distribution of Bitcoin that is uh, accepted in the chain of transactions, right? So initially, every single uh, Bitcoin traces itself back to a Coinbase output, which is one of those miners, one of those nodes has done the proof of work, has, uh, has built on top of the valid chain or built... Uh, parallel or built an extension to the valid chain, right? And um, and that and so it traces itself back. So um, and this works sort of like a family tree. Like so so how do I know that you came from the male family? Is that how you pronounce it? Male, yeah. Male, male family. Well, the way that you look at that is you know you have this. Uh, lineage that goes all the way back. You do the same thing with the Bitcoin, but instead of it being a lineage of uh, parental figures and grandparents, etc., the uh, all of their um, ancestry is instead of uh, being you know a human being that put it there on Earth or something, it is this uh, uh, an output an accepted output being spent by someone. It could have been, you know, someone for a cup of coffee or it could have been someone for the Mona Lisa or something. But there's this chain of of transactions that go all the way back to an original output by the Coinbase, by the miner. And, and so, and that gets kept track of by the nodes. That's the responsibility is to keep track of it. And this is what we need distributed consensus for, because if we allowed only one single entity, let's just say like, oh, this is such an important job. We really want to make sure that someone takes, you know, really good care of this. So we will let like the the government, you know, the a world order government institution, like the IMF or something like that, they can keep track of this and and we'll just they'll just tell us what's what's right and what's wrong. But that goes all the way back to the problem of the teacher with the red apple and the blue apple. Like then now we're supposed to just accept that this is a spendable output just because the IMF says it's a spendable output. But when in reality, when you can make it so that it's not just one entity that's keeping track of all these outputs, but it's several different entities that are competing with each other that want to earn the next Bitcoin that are, are trying to be more efficient, more productive, more responsive, more, uh, you know, innovative, more tools for their customers, et cetera. This is the unique thing that Satoshi has done is that he's pulled in and harnessed the power of uh, free enterprise to compete, to perform a function that is extremely automatable. The prop, the question is not whether or not this is automatable. It's, it's, imminently automatable and it's com just computing functions right you just figure out okay this plus this it always equals this you can never you know it never you know you can check it from china you can check it from japan you can check it from finland you can check it from america just like two plus two equals four it always is going to come out to the same answer um so so it's really easy to check these things what's hard is to trust the the you know the information that's being given to you. So, so we need to make it as costly as possible to be deceptive. <laughs> hmm. Okay, Brett, you know, in, uh, in George Gilder's book, uh, uh, you know, life after Bitcoin, he describes a fictional town called Crestwood. And he talks about how all the people in Crestwood, you know, the people who used Google at the time, they would, 
they would you know advertise on Google with SEO and they would describe their business on Google and their and people would come to their support their local business there depending on how much how invested they were with Google so they could find themselves then then one day in this fictional town called Crestwood according to the book says that Google was no not accessible and all the people that were dependent on it would all of a sudden be you know they they could not they just couldn't operate and they had to go back into this peer to peer you know uh society and he begins to make this case for you know for for ultimately for bitcoin and and i wanted to or, or decentralized or distributed so i wanted to get a better understanding of like what what do you know about george gilder and this life after google you know and how it all relates to where we you know to bitcoin and what we're doing now so yeah it, yeah thank you well uh one thing that um you know, I was really lucky to have is uh, my father uh, was a great educator for me and a great visionary as well as futurist. So when you think about George Gilder, you're thinking Did you about say futurist. Some... Yeah. Yeah. What's a futurist? Yes. Yeah. Well, when you think about George Gilder, I think you think of a futurist and, and uh, someone who is imagining a next phase of the world that uh that people aren't seeing yet you know so um and and i didn't know about the term futurist either uh prior to george gilder he was actually the first person that i found that was coined that way when you think about him so what is a futurist well what is an economist economist is someone that really studies deeply the economy you know and uh and so a futurist is someone who is really deeply familiar with or studying the future and potentially future patterns. So, um, so my dad was a uh, copy salesman, and he um, had just an absolutely extraordinary journey to his uh, to his success. Phenomenally successful, um, and you know, I was remember being a young a young boy and uh, listening to my dad explain to me uh, that that there was this thing that was coming. Uh, called the internet, you know, and that it was going to have your, uh, you were going to have screens and your phones were going to be connected to the TV screens and you would be able to watch movies. And I remember being like eight or seven or eight or nine and listening to this and going like, you'll be able to watch a movie from your home, you know, on a, on a communication line. This is crazy. You know, so he and, was telling um, you about what he believed the future would be like yes. this, as a little kid. Yes, okay. exactly. And and uh, and so I, the reason why I'm bringing that back to George Gilder was because um, with George Gilder, uh, they say that he was, you know, one thing that I love about the story about George Gilder is that they say uh, he was in the room with, uh, I think it's Stanley Moore, when the term Moore's Law got conceived, you know, so we talk about, oh, that's Moore's Law, right? Like we take for granted the fact that like, that there was a real Moore that was like the one that figured Moore's law out. Right. And George Gooder, he was literally in the room when he figured out when, when Stanley Moore figured out Moore's law. So well, he's got, talk, he's got clout. He's got, he's got, he's got clout. Got... He's got chops. Right. And <laughs> and the thing is that the thing is that, um, and this is something that I want to go back to with Craig too, because, uh, because one of the things that you tend to do is you tend to see this new technology and you think like, you know, that it's going to completely change the fabric of society. Like, oh, by the time we have flying cars, right, we won't have the need for laws or we won't have the need for this or that or whatever, right? But in reality, what it is, is that it's oftentimes not that the um, that the technology itself is changing the the essence of our society, but it's really just giving it a new uh, avenue to to go down or to be expressed through. Um, so if you just think back to like electricity or something like that, like, you know, the the advent or discovery of electricity, you know, it didn't really change our need for, you know, to get together as people and, and, uh, and congregate and, and all this stuff, it just changed the mechanism or medium by which we were, uh, we were congregating through in the, in our lit places from, you know, uh, flames on the sides of the sidewalks. And the, the other thing that, that electricity did, which I think it's, should uh it's sometimes even though it's a, an obvious concept sometimes the obvious concepts really uh are the most are the most uh enlightening that that um you know 
that it, because electricity was easier to transmit, right? Like previously when you had to just congregate around lit certain, you know, locations and things like that really had to have them like all centered in a single location, right? Because, you know, you're not going to just build like a, um, a row of like street lamps to go all the way out into the desert or go all the way out into the middle of nowhere. Right. Like, so you were really incentivized to like huddle and, and to keep your communities really close, et cetera. And then electricity came along and it's like, okay, well, not only can we use it to, um, to like light our streets better than maybe like kerosene or something like that they were doing in like 1780s or something like that, but we can use it to, uh, to light places that are farther away that are more remote that we now our society has a little bit of a, a more inclination to spread itself wider right and um and so so maybe so if we use the parallel to george gilder and to you know his vision for the um you know the next wave after google like if we think about google as being similar to the kerosene lamps right we as a society they're the information center right like we want to all the time be we want to easily use Google, um, emails and things like that. Google gives us a great mode to use that, et cetera. But really what we're doing is we're sort of like huddling as a society around this informational behemoth that is, you know, like um, just feeding us things that are really convenient. Like what time does uh, the store down the street close? Like I just put it in Google and it tells me the hours right away. Right. So, um, but, uh, but maybe uh, there's a parallel there where, the you know the 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 problem with that that re over reliance and the overly huddling right becoming too huddled right is that we sort of tend to get uh kind of like lost in the um in the the overarching uh ideas and the overarching um emphasis of these organizations these technocratic organizations that have you know that have uh, that are they themselves are honeypots they themselves have agendas sometimes for the world and sometimes those agendas you know relate directly to just their own bottom line or their own shareholders or things like that but then oftentimes they relate to more than just their own bottom line or more than just uh their share the the value for their shareholders. And, you know, you saw that a lot really on display over the past two or three years with the Elon Musk's taking over of Twitter, where you just saw, okay, like here is clearly this organization that has a lot of influence and pull within the government that is using its, um, you know, like uh, its influence, et cetera, to, to filter what information people are finding, what information they find is relevant and to ostracize certain information. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, so I think with George Gilder, he's, he's naturally very, uh, very good at sort of picking up on that stuff. And he's sort of seeing that, you know, as we move away from these technocratic uh, behemoths that are what what's really good about them is that they give access you it's a really great access point. So for example, like, you know, uh, someone that has no idea about email or something like this, right? They, they're they not going to be setting up their own SMTP server, right? They're not going to be, uh, they're, they're not going to be, they're, they're just going to the access point. That's where you get it, you know? Um, and so, so yeah, but there, that it carries with it this, this, uh, especially when you're talking about information, um, this, this onus of responsibility and, you know, not to again, go too deeply, uh, political, but it's just a, it's a, it's a really great example, which is just like, you know, the, the, um, the basically the spying on all on all information globally by the three letter agencies etc you know so you have these these three letter agencies that are like well we want to know what every single american is doing regardless of whether or not it's we really have the legal uh the legal you know background or the the legal uh um, ability to do that. Um, so we're just gonna, we're just gonna set up this agency that just spider crawls the all communications, all messages, etc. And, and, uh, you know, when you have the access to like an information repository, like Google or something like that, um, you just, you know, you, you can either try and go out and, and, uh, and, and get every single person individually, or you can just get the one organization that all information goes through. And, and that's sort of, you know, uh, again, not, not to, you know, sometimes these are my own thoughts and ideas. So I'm not trying to say that this is necessarily what Craig was um, thinking about with Bitcoin, but 
But, uh, you know, Craig talks a lot about the difference between a mesh network and a small world network. And small world networks are commonly associated with George Gilder. I went back to uh, talk about my dad and saying, you know, he was involved in the copy machine business. He was really mm -hmm. instrumental in introducing the fax machine uh, globally uh, to um, to the at least to the eastern border of the United of the United States in terms of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, et cetera. And he had a, uh, a partnership worked out with Canon, Canon USA. And, um, and, you know, he knew firsthand that like, you know, the value of a fax machine, well, well, the very first business that he wheeled the fax machine into and said, Hey, would you like to buy a fax machine? They go, well, who the heck else has a fax machine? You know, like, how am I supposed to, uh, you know, what value is it? If there's no one else that you're going to buy the very first one, you know, like congratulations, <laughs> you know, no, but, but it, it's 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 more it's less valuable to less people that have it right and but that's the value of the small world network that's something that george gilder talks about uh you know that as more and more people got fax machines now the value of the fax machine grows because you can use them to communicate with other people and uh and so so um you know when craig was uh was talks about this the switching from a uh, mesh network to a small world network you know he talks a lot about uh the vision of bitcoin as completing the original vision of the internet because the original vision of the internet was really this small world network where you're going peer to peer you know i need to send a packet to you i send it to you directly you know but it became just a logistical problem especially with ipv4 and i know that you want to get into ipv6 so this could be a good uh a good precursor conversation to that but with ipv4 you just have so much less subnet address space where basically like i can't get you a i can't get you a packet direct to your uh ip address because at the end of the day your ip address is sitting under some subnet host that uh that you know is is um you know just just that that we basically need to consolidate all of those addresses down into these um, various different uh, data right. points that are sitting off of these <clears throat> these subnets. Before we go there, just take me <laughs> take me back. I'm a little bit more into the story of like so you know how we got here. So we got your dad's uh, selling fax machines to Canon yep. up in the East Coast. It sounds yep. like. And there wasn't any fax machines at this time. So it was like the first one or whatever, you know, yeah. buy this fax machine. You can't communicate with anybody. And then uh, somewhere along after that, you're born. And then yep. you, uh, he says, hey, you know, these fax machines are great. But one day uh, he, he has some sort of uh, information. He must have had an insider information or a vision that one day you're going to be talking on your cell phone to another person mm -hmm. with a camera. Uh, you know, or, I mean, did this... This idea of of not only that, but like this world of of Bitcoin, and and Bitcoin is just a, a just a word, but like this, uh, how do I better describe it? Like this world of distributed consensus, this world of uh, sovereign of sovereignty. Really, that's mm -hmm. what it is. It's like a independent sovereignty. You know, did did he did he kind of direct you to that? To where when you discovered it after what was it in twenty twenty? I guess it wasn't until twenty twenty that you really discovered it, right? So right, right. That it was like, oh, this this all makes sense to what I was because it seems like you got it fast. Yeah. Oh, I mean, at least not. But and then so I mean, is that anyways? I'm I'm just trying to gather the momentum. Like, did did your dad kind of like push you towards that in a vision at some point, and it all just clicked? Like, this is it. You know. Yeah. It all. Not, in in the sense that he really primed me and in the sense that uh, that I learned a lot from him about business and economics at the, the dinner table, you know, um, but that I was always just very data curious and very technology curious. And um, and so so it's it might also be one of those things where, like, you know, he told me he probably told me a lot of things and, and maybe uh, the the TVs and the internet and, and the hooking up the cell phones and, you know, getting movies streamed through uh, this data, these data channels, et cetera. Maybe that was just the one that stuck with me most because it was just the, uh, the one that I was most intrigued by, but yeah, where there was, you know, going back into the ages when I was, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, I was, you know, using IRC channels and, and connecting peer with uh, different peer networks and peer groups 
that were, um, you know, tran transferring MP3s, et cetera, and encoding MP3s and worked with a group that built the, um, the Sonique, uh, Sonique platform, which is like, you know, the Winamp platform also were, were involved, but with those IRC channels, but, you know, I ended up just getting sort of stumbling into these uh, IRC channels with like people that were building the fabric and framework for this, like, you know, next uh data revolution in terms of you know sharing music and doing peer channels and stuff like that but it i sounds had like it, stood uh, up know, my own ftp server like really i should have asked ages. you better uh that it was more about like he told you about even the internet like the internet itself before it was hap before it had happened is that right yeah he 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 painted that picture for me in a way that was like that that it blew my mind because i you know i i come from a you know an age when we used to make phone calls by rolling the, the, the numbers, you know what I mean? Like, so I don't know if you are, uh, are from that age also, but you know, like I've seen this massive transition, you know? So like, you know, it's just funny because we, uh, but yeah, like the, the, con the all, all of these concepts, like when you think of going from a rotary phone, like it was only a few years after we got our first, you know, touch phone or something. And we're, and, and he's like telling me about the internet and you know, movies coming through and stuff like this. It was so hard for me to imagine. And I, and, but looking back uh, now, I'm like, wow, it's was, it was like really prescient, you know? And, uh, and, you know, he's really a visionary um, and, uh, and I have a visionary element too, where we just sort of like, you know, close our eyes and we can just see things like, you know, and he used to say that uh, you have to treat it like it's a diamond, you know, and you put the diamond in the center of the room and then you step back from it and, you know, you kind of walk around it and you look at it from all the different sides because it refracts in different ways. The facets uh, send the light off in different sides. So, you know, you really he really encouraged me to to put my ideas onto a pedestal or a table or something in the center and just sort of see if I can't see them differently from different perspectives, et cetera. That was something that was important. So it seems like now uh, with, with that visionary mindset where you're, you know, you, you've been talking, we talked about George Gilder and your dad being like a futurist and these, uh, you know, seeing these where things are going to end up now, you know, it's really, it looks like you're totally immersed in Bitcoin and you're like, you're having fun with it. You're, you're just, you're doing, you're in your element, you know, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, but it doesn't seem like it's just a job for you. It's more than just like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm at a job, you know, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm trying to get a better understanding for like how you're drawn to it. You know, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're somehow magnetized to it. What, 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 what causes that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, I guess one of the w best ways to explain it is like, you know, they go back to the concept of the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, you know? And, uh, and I think that, um, I think that the Bitcoin network is our best effort and maybe the best shot we have at truly building a world where it's possible for us to more deeply follow that golden rule, right? Because in some respects, you know, like when you talked about George Gilder and the, and the Google, you know, and the Google monstrosity, et cetera, you know, in some respects, you know, like, uh, like, you know, the, some of these data breaches and the ability to, you know, to, uh, to be overly, um, you know, uh, ha you know, have too much of your data without, without really your, your, uh, and, and to be violating some of your privacy and stuff like that. You know, this is just something that sign that you just sign up to by just sort of a clicking, accept the terms and conditions, you know, when you get involved with these giant megaliths of like information, right. If we had a little bit more of that onus of that data sovereignty, et cetera, but we had, um, you know, like Ty Everett, uh, from project Babbage talks a lot about, you know, building application layers, uh, that um, that uh, at their heart and at their core and their and at their center are are like requesting information from us and then and then we're providing that information voluntarily, et cetera, right? So if you and I are engaged in a platform that is you know respectful of our privacy and not overly um, you know. Uh, taking of it, et cetera, then, then we have a better relationship to enact those golden rules with each other. Right. Because, um, because, you know, you're, you, we, we are able to exchange more, more authentically with each other, as opposed to, I feel that, you know, and, and again, that's why we talk about it's, it's network topology. We're talking about, we're also talking about 
uh, how do we want to live as species, as a society, and what's the next 200 years going to look like? Because we're right on the dawn, I feel like, of this brand new uh, shift. We're going to uh, begin it really soon. And, um, and, you know, and, and so, so it's not just about what do we want to do today, January, you know, 15th, we we're also talking about, you know, the next, what do we want to uh, pass down to our children? Um, and, and, and I've seen the movement from a rotary phone to, you know, we're sending electronic cash peer to peer right now, you know, like not many people are aware about it, you know, but, but we're doing it. And that's in a very, very tiny time window. Like my, you know, children, if that same time window when applied to my children, what is the future? What is their revelation that, that my dad gave me about the internet? What can I give them? What's down the road, 40, 60 years, et cetera. I'm excited by all of that stuff. And, um, and so, you know, when it comes to the Bitcoin network, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is my job and it's, and it's something that I, I love being able to do. And I, it, I'm so thankful because, because it's only my job because I refused to give up. I truly just was like, you know, it, it was something where they, it didn't even exist for a while. Like, you know, so like, how am I supposed to find a job related to my passion? There's, it doesn't even, it hasn't been invented yet. I need Craig Wright to invent it so that I can get a job <laughs> explaining it, you know, like, but, um, but it's like, you know, like, uh, it's just so much bigger than, than that. And, and I always say that it's not my special art project. I know it probably is Craig's right. Uh, even though I think that he has a very mature take on it, um, when it comes to, but it's like, yeah, it doesn't have to be, um, this exact thing, right? Like that's the beauty about something that is bigger than any of the things that constitute it because it it's the ideas that matter. Right. And it's, and, and it's just our best effort at reproducing the conditions that enable those ideas that enable us to be better neighbors for each other. That I think is really the thing that I strongly am going to work towards for the rest of my life. And if that just so happens to be Bitcoin, which I think it is, then that just so happens to be Bitcoin. And if it turns out that it's something else, then that's where my heart's going to follow, you know, because at the end of the day, I think that, you know, not to, to, uh, to um, draw from, you know, Martin Luther King, but, you know, he said that I can never be the person that I'm truly meant to be until you, until you are who you're truly meant to be. And likewise, you can never be who you're meant to be until I am who I'm meant to be. So in a way we have this responsibility to each other. And that's something that I, I draw on from my year of silence. You know, it's like, I learned something so valuable and important and deep about myself by taking that that uh initiative and 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 doing the hard work it was work there my head was full of crap you know you have to rip it all away you know and just really gut it down to what's there what what do you really care about what's left and it's like the thing that's left you think of that thing as this empty hollow you know useless worthless that's the thing i'm trying to put tapestry over i'm going to try to wallpaper over that that's what i don't want people to see that's what you need to you need to love that thing you know that's who you are so so, so uh what, yeah. what caught what inspired you to be doing a year of silence yeah so my and was it was it by yourself or with a group or and and was it like you just turned on your 18th birthday it was like one year i'm doing this or how did it well, give me a better yeah. background well, I'll tell you a funny story. So I was 18 years old and I decided that I wanted to be a stripper. And a male so, stripper. A male stripper. Chippendales. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Chippendales. Nice. I just All thought because right. I was a How's dancer. That? Remember, I said I yeah, went to like, you know, so so yeah. I was like, Yeah, this will be a great way to get money. I'll meet lots of girls. Like, I'll just go and be a stripper, you know. Perfect. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And um my, I told my mom, you know, and she said, Oh, perfect. Yeah. And myself and your grandmother will be there for your very first show. And I said, okay, I, I don't really want to be a stripper anymore. So, so it's funny because my mom has this wonderful way of sort of, um, you know, she, she got me to, if she had told me you can't be a stripper, then I would have been a stripper, you know, she, she got me to not do it, but she did it uh, just so much more like Aikido, you know, she used my energy. I'll be there to support you. Exactly. <laughs> oh, exactly. And so, so I told her, I said, well, I'm going to take a year vow of silence. And she was like, great. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, we'll support you. You do a year vow of silence. Meanwhile, I'm sure in the back of her head, she's singing, he's never going to do this year vow of silence, you know? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that was my, 
my foray into it, I was uh, 18. I guess I was intrigued by the ideas. I was intrigued by the concept of, you know, I was interested in a little bit of Eastern wisdom and stuff like that. And I know monks went and did vows of silence. And I thought, you know, maybe I could be this like teenager in a modern America that's, you know, trying to tap into this monk like state and see if there's you know, some, some wisdom or some value out of that. And, uh, but yeah, I was just completely unprepared for it. I just, you know, was, was, you know, as the way that I like to think is I just was full of answers. I had an answer for everything. I knew the reason for everything. And, you know, it just, I was just full of crap, you know, like all my answers and logic, they all just recycled on themselves. Well, because if I, if you take this, if you take this for true, then that's for true. Then this is for true. Then, you know, and really you got to like, you got to say, yeah, but like we started off with, with this being true, but what if that part's not true? <laughs> like, or what if, what if that's just your perspective on it, you know? And, and so, so really what I did was just, I just, uh, re- replaced it with nothing you know i didn't replace it with a different way of thinking about things or something like that I really just tried to replace it with okay well i don't have anything then i just take tomorrow see what happens you know <laughs> so you took it you it sounds like you became this uh sponge for information at that point and you had to deal with your own thoughts and then you just started taking everything in and like re- rebuilding everything saying i don't yeah. have all the answers anymore because i can't share all my answers i'm quiet I, i'm silent and so you become I, suspicious of answers when an answer shows up and it's, oh, I'm the next greatest thing. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the thing that you should start. You should train yourself to keep me in your head because I'm the, I'm the new thing that you need to think about. That's suspicious. You know, like get out. I don't need you. I'll figure it out when it comes along. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, just a general, a general suspicion for, for things that try to implant themselves as, as uh, the new way you should think of it. So it sounds like you had planned it out. You know, you're 18 and you just planned it out by this day, next year, you're going to stop doing it. And you just stuck to it. You know, well, you just I mark mostly, it on a calendar every single day. All right. That's it. One day, one day, two. Yeah. I mean, or was it just like, I'm going to do it. And I, I'm just, just sounds like a, a wild. I mean, I'm just wondering about how you set that goal. That's a great goal. And you obviously accomplished it. Very yeah. Hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, I probably wouldn't have done it, you know, because it is, it was a monumental task, you know, but I ended up telling a friend about it and then he uh, told his mom about it. She was a publicist for a state Senator whose name was Eileen Ammond, a state Senator for New Jersey, I believe. And she had um, her, uh, you know, her daughter who was my friend's mom, who was named as Karen Ammon and ran a company called KBC Media. Uh, she was the publicist for her mother's state senator campaign. And so she had some connections with the press. So she sent out a, a PR statement that just said uh, she, she had a statement. It was a full page, one page statement on some other topic. I forget exactly what it was, but it was a one page statement. And at the very bottom, she just put, oh, yeah. And also I'm talking to this kid from New Jersey who's taking a year about silence. She put it out on the press and then instantly we had just floods of phone calls and television dates where people wanted to find out what I was doing. So I, if, if it had never gotten into the press or anything like that, if it was just me and my, and my, uh, my willpower, you know, I have some good willpower, but I don't know. I would have had the willpower to go the whole year. And in reality, I probably don't think I needed the whole year because I got so much wisdom out of the first two weeks. I always used to tell people that two weeks, you know, they do these silent retreats and stuff like that, that you can go to in the mountains, et cetera. You really don't need more than that. You don't need to go the full year or anything like that. But there's so much value in really getting doing some deep investigative inquiry work and do into who you are. And when you are taking you uh, when you're not speaking, you're just like stuck you know you're like on you island you know like that's all you got it's just what's going on up here so like you start you start oh i'm thinking of this now i'm thinking of this i'm thinking of that now you know like and you start to get tired right it's just like you're like why am i thinking so much this is annoying i need to stop thinking i need to shut some of this stuff down it's just overkill and uh and instead just start like seeing just see what's around me you know what i mean it's we fail to do that a lot of times because our thinking is so incessant you know yeah nice all right so back to uh bsv and you know i guess what what 
a couple of uh, questions I had before you go into the IPv6 stuff. I mean, and this is just more of a, you're work, working with the Bitcoin Association. Is it possible that BSV can have a stable coin or is it necessary? Is it, is it possible or does it? I mean, I'm mean, like, I'm just thinking I had this given example uh, just the other day, a person, a foreign in a foreign country, I think it was India. They wanted me to send them USD tether. So I went on there and I bought the tether on Ethereum and it, I paid for the credit card fees. I paid on a four or $5 to get the, it was only $50. So they only, they only wanted $50. It's like, okay, no problem. $4 in credit card fees to get it. And then another $8 and 20 cents in gas fees. Uh, so I'm, I ended up spending, I don't know, $63 to send, yeah. to send 50, you know, yeah. total. So I'm just thinking like, and I asked them, I said, you guys don't, aren't doing BSV big. They're like, we never heard of that. We were, <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 And I don't, I mean, you know, theoretically, no, you don't really need to have a stable coin because BSV is cash is, and is Bitcoin it? is yeah. cash. Yeah. And, uh, and Craig, you know, like, um, uh, one of the nice parts, so about Copa, you know, like and and some of his other lawsuits, is that it forced, you know, for you know, probably for worse for him, but for better for us, a lot of public documents out there that we get to review and stuff like that that show, like, what? like when he's talking about, um, you know, Bitcoin with his tax authority or with the Australian tax office in uh in 2009 you know and he's and they're saying yeah so it's like cash and he's saying no i'm not saying i'm not using the word like <laughs> it is cash this is electronic cash you know and uh you need to think of it like that you need to think of this as cash i see so think of it thinking of it as cash therefore there is no need for a stable coin well, not well. That's your point. In a in a perfect world, maybe. Yeah, in a perfect, in a perfect world, world, there's no world. There's no need for a stable coin because it itself is the cash, right? But it's also one of those things where, like, okay, but, uh, but you know, like, and I hate to use this example too, but like, you know, a baby. Uh, you don't just go like from nursing to like, you know, a steak, you know, like a, a filet mignon with, you know, like, like there's a, there's an intermediary period there where like, you know, if, if you could think of us as like the baby, you know, like, yes, like we, we need some, sometimes the stable coin can be like the Gerber food. It's chopped up for us. It looks like, you know, it doesn't look like a vegetable, right. But it is a vegetable, like it is Bitcoin, but it looks like a U.S. dollar to us, you know, so we're willing to spoon feed it to us. You know? <laughs> so, so yeah, but as long, but the thing is that, but the Bitcoin is capable of that. Bitcoin can, doesn't have, I mean, it is cash, but it it's also a, a network for, um for building and running and maintaining um, uh, you know, your own token sets, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, th there's no reason why those token sets couldn't be, uh, either some sort of stable token that is being issued privately or, uh, or, um, you know, uh, issued even by a government decree, but, you know, again, like going back to, so, you know, I'm a neophyte, I'm like a total layman when it comes to excuse me, when it comes to a lot of this stuff. And, uh, and I found, I found Craig to be such a wealth and repository of information for me where, you know, he goes in depth and in detail about how, you know, no money really started as being a public, uh, a publicly decreed money, right? Money gets its roots from private money. And, um, and even James Belding from Tokenize talks about this, although it's a slightly different topic, but James Belding says, you know, like, if you think, just think about the, um, the amount of wealth that exists out there in the public stock markets, et cetera, like all of the majors, you know, Apple, Walmart, right? All of the largest companies in the world that are being publicly traded right now, and I think James Belding was saying, you know, the amount of wealth that's sitting out there in private equity just dwarfs the public equity. Like we're talking about these are the biggest corporations in the world, like, you know, and uh, and you can collectively take all of them publicly. And it's still like probably 20 to one, the amount of wealth that's sitting in private equity and private arrangements, private agreements. And, you know, one of his that's one of his arguments for using tokenized platform is that, you know, the um, you know, the public uh, equity markets, they have a much more modernized infrastructure in terms of, OK, like 
in the 80s, they shifted, you know, from paper receipts and paper certificates to digital certificates, you know, and, and, but, you know, there's the reason, this is one of those things like, you know, when we, when we sort of throw the centralized way of looking at things under the bus, a lot of times, because we're Bitcoiners, you know, centralized equals bad, right? But at the same time, sometimes there's benefits to having a centralized systems because the public equity markets, you know, those are being maintained and they're, they were being professionalized and modernized by this instinct of the fact that there's a centralized uh you know system like that is monitoring and maintaining them so they don't want to have to do all the various different you know we sign uh this type of paperwork and we sign this type of paperwork hey we're all in the same public stock you know network we're all going to use the same infrastructure and same uh tools so that we can keep track of who owns what and how many of these are issued and all this stuff but the private sector you know it doesn't have any of that and that's a, a benefit in some way regards right because again there's not that honeypot of having you know all the world's uh, wealth all being, you know, monitored by a single organization that could get it wrong, et cetera. The fact that it's all over the place, you know, like more of like an asteroid belt or something like that, as opposed to a single, you know, um, single planet. But uh, but then the, the the bad side of that or the downside of that is that the, they, there's no standardization across this whole, you know, uh, private private equity sector so so really like that's that's the that's the big thing too that as bitcoin's coming in and as ipv6 is coming in etc that you are seeing the capacity for this you know like much more um standardized uh way in which we're exchanging value with each other and in which we're evaluating information with each other Hmm. okay so looks like uh you know maybe a good time to go over to like what why what is ipv6 and and why should anyone care about it you know is it and then how what is its relationship to to the b to the bitcoin network or the bsv blockchain network it seems like it's a it's a big topic yeah but yeah, why, so- why should we care about it because you know for a, as a novice what what what, what does it matter yeah yeah, yeah so um well, same with like, okay, let's just use another example, right? Like an Ethernet port, you know, versus like an HDMI port or something like that, right? Like, do you probably remember, you know, the old when you're trying to like, you know, get your, uh, you know, your your uh, computer screen onto your TV or something like this, but like, you know, we're still living in the 90s or something like this. But okay, you go to the get the Ethernet port, you know, like, and it, it has those little screws. You have to like screw them in, and it's like a 16 prong port. And oh no no, they've gone to 18 prongs now. You got to go to 18. Go get a brand new one, right? So is IPv6 just another one of those new uh, fan dangled ports that we have to get, et cetera? Um, or is it something fundamentally different? You know, so with IPv6, you know, the the um, the first thing that I think is is really um, like separates it from IPv4. So you can do all the stuff that you can do with IPv4, which is just all it is, is just an addressing system, right? It's just like a way of addressing data. Um, and the, and the, and the, uh, the, the, um, space in which, you know, that data can be, can be addressed, right? Here's a, you know, this is, I've never thought of it this way, but like, you know, if you really want to get down to it, like how many colors exist in the world or something like this, right? Well, if you just like use the classic example that you're taught in kindergarten, maybe there's like red, orange, you know, the rainbow, like red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, indigo, or something like that, right? So there's like nine, right? But then there's like kind of a color between indigo and violet. There's kind of a color between blue and, you know, so like, okay, okay, let's re let's go back to the drawing board and then you know like how nuanced can you get that color set right well well there's uh you know famously like i think there's this uh, I think we have three different types of cones and rods in our eyes or something like this. I don't know if you've ever heard about this, but like, you know, we see like red, you know, blue and green or something like this, you know. And uh, and then there was this woman that got born with a fourth cone in her eyes. So she sees some color that we don't see or something like this. So like the colors that she can see, like maybe we can see 16,000 colors or something, you know, like that we can differentiate. She can see like... 32 million or something like this right like and it's like to us like you know i don't know if you've ever like looked at a bird in a black light or something like this like you know the the bird to our eyes looks like it just you know like uh 
you know, because the males usually are, ha are really colorful, right? Because they want to get the female's attention, right? So the bird to our eyes just looks like it's got black wings, right? But then you put a black light on it or something and you see like orange, green, blue, right? Like there's these brilliant arrays of colors, but we just have no capacity to see them. So IPv6 is kind of like that, but for the addressing space of the telnet uh, networks, right? So we, you know, where is my device broadcasting from my device is broadcasting from the subnet of you know the local isp that we're in and then uh, out of the local isp that we're in i'm divided into the region that i'm in etc you know and then and then uh once i connect to the public wi-fi i'm given a sort of like you know subset of that uh routing uh you know, network. So again, like, but like, it's very much homogenized, right? It goes back to this, like, you know, the region that I'm in, but like, you know, I don't have a, an address that like, if I could go all the way to the other side of the world, I could go to Australia. I'm still at that same address. It's just that I'm accessing that address through like a different means, et cetera. So, um, and the reason why we can't do that is because there's just not enough addressing space to uh, give addresses to all the devices individually, et cetera, right? Um, and then, uh, and then the, the reason why this relates to Bitcoin, and I'm going to take a tiny tangent here because I lo love telling the story and I think it's relative or relevant in terms of like exactly what size of numbers we're talking about. So, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but I love this story. So, so indulge me, but, uh, but if you've ever shuffled a playing deck of cards and sort of like, you know, really sufficiently shuffled them so that they're really decently shuffled, you know, maybe like 10 or 12 times that you've shuffled them, et cetera. Uh, you know, that never before in the entire history of humanity has that deck ever been shuffled in that, uh, in that exact order before. So it's like, it seems like a preposterous statement, right? Like that's, that's, that's ridiculous. There's only 52 of them, but like the way to qual or to figure that out in math is 52 factorial, and the number of different permutations that you could get out of a 52 factorial or something is so large that the likelihood that it would have ever been shuffled in that manner before previously in the entire history of time is so low that if for the entire history of 15 billion years that the earth has been in existence or something, if everyone that's ever been alive has shuffled once per second, you know, the number would still be a one with 64 zeros at the end of it, right? So you're talking extremely, extremely, extremely wow. improbable that a single deck of 52 cards would ever be shuffled that way. So the reason why I'm bringing that up is because uh, when we're talking about Bitcoin and stuff, you know, you have this 256 bits of data and information, right? So um, you have the ability theoretically for different for two people to have the same address, right? Uh, but not know each other, right? Uh, these are called sometimes by Craig and uh, as collisions or a single hash, a single piece of data that hashes into a 256 bit string that another piece of data also hashes into, right? Because it's deterministic. So there is out there multiple different types of, or multiple different data that will hash into the same result, right? But, but, the thing that uh, makes Bitcoin so unique is that it's not that it's it's impossible. It's it's that it's economically uh, it, that it's improbable, and that the economics of it are sufficient enough to account for that that slight slight you know improbability. And so um, so you know looking at IPv6 just as a address space that has the same kind of dimensions, right? That it's so. Um, it's so extravagant in terms of how large the dimension or the uh, the addressing space is for IPv6 that I think you could give every single atom in the universe, uh, you know, its own IPv6 address and still have a, you know, a massive, uh, hang on with, for you, just one second. I'm on vacation right now. Yeah. Oh, you're on vacation. Where are you? Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, when I was a kid, I used to come out here to um, Cancun with my mother and father. And uh, so now that I have kids, I take them out here as well. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. So back to, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about IPv6 and all these, sub, you know, other subjects. You know, 
Let me just ask you, uh, this is a more of a security question. With all these computers solving all these problems on proof of work, so you've got this incredible problem solving device with the miners and the A6 is they're getting better and better and better. Have you considered uh, the risk? Okay, so Bitcoin is made up of like 12 words on a secret password. Is that right? Yeah, so let's say that, you you know, a guy has his, all of his 12 words on his on his Bitcoin and a secret password, and he got it in a safe somewhere, and only he knows that he's got it in a trust. And, you know, it's his whole life savings is in there. Okay. On these 12 words. When you, you know, when you talk about like these computers solving these problems to mine blocks, um, have you at all considered about the possibilities of computers solving the problems of these 12 words to hack into, let's say, the Genesis block of Satoshi and get a million Bitcoin? Uh, is that is that at all a risk that somebody should be concerned with? Uh, or have well, you considered this at all? Yeah. 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 So it it is technically a risk you know that uh that that could happen i could just go to you know because they ask you at the wallet page to input your 12 words right i could just input 12 random ones you know and hope that i get access to someone's bitcoins um but uh it's just the it's sort of like what we were talking about before where there's just you know a degree of impracticality to that that uh makes it so that if every human alive try to guess them in perpetuity you know for the entire existence of the the uh the world you know you're still getting an improbability of finding one just by sheer chance of you know like an unquantifiable number so and the the reason why that's relevant is because again going drawing back from the wisdom of dr wright etc where you know the system isn't perfect you know and and i think it's like it's purposefully not perfect um, because maybe, you know, like you, you could create, you know, a more complex system, you know, if you really wanted to, but, uh, but it's, it's that it's sufficient for, um, for human, uh, you know, I guess agency, it's sufficient for our needs. Um, and, and one of the problems, and this sort of gets uh, thrown around, you know, by, by a lot of different people as we evaluate Bitcoin is that, you know, it's oftentimes the pursuit of, of a purely perfect system that gets in the way of it actually being functional and usable. Because like at the end of the day, you know, those 12 words, they do represent an attack vector, right? Because like, you know, uh, and this, and this gets back to the, you know, determinism of hash functions and things like this, where, where like at the end of the day, yeah, they, they, uh, you could make them more arbitrarily complex in order to preserve, instead of going from like, you know, a number with like, um, a thousand zeros and then a, a, a one, you could maybe have 10,000 zeros and a one in terms of the improbability of, of there being this collision, et cetera. Right. But, um, but you know the 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 nice part about this is that and it's a good it's a good uh it, you know way to to draw it back into our just actual laws you know like as a species you know that um that even if that were the case even if there even if i was able to access your bitcoins by just you know maybe i become a a superhuman and and guess or we invent a technology that allows for, for the guessing etc um, much, much more. It, th those are still your coins, you know, in the same way that I could sit in front of your house and try to like, like chisel, you know, <laughs> a lock that fits exactly your, your house, but it doesn't mean that, you know, I, I could become very good at that and I can spend all my time doing that. But the moment I get in access into your house, it doesn't actually make your house belong to me. And, and so, you know, the, the thing is that, you know, although this is, has room in terms of there uh, could be, you know, like these collisions or there could be these vulnerabilities, you know, that that's not actually a, a bug. That's a feature. The, um, the vulnerabilities in a way are uh, sufficient to the degree to which we need them as human beings for our daily lives. And if we were trying to use this to secure some alien technology or something like that against you know like not just the next 10,000 years of our lifetime and the, the next 10,000 years of computer developments but maybe the next 2 million years of computer developments you know um 
then you know that like craig says you know that that's a problem that my my grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren can work on because this is sufficient for for uh for where we're to, at 2024 now. yeah yeah okay so yeah. uh you know on that note what what you know would be good to ask you oh man i just uh let me just you know we were talking about some of the security features and you know, I wanted to find out more about the story. If you have a insight on the story about, I think it was a hundred thousand Bitcoin that Dr. Wright says were taken or he lost. And now he's created a lawsuit about it. And, you know, possibly that could set precedent. Can you tell the story on that as to what, you know, please? Yeah. Yeah. So this isn't, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, this isn't uh, well. I'll start off with just a a short explanation, and and uh, I want to give a um shout out. To that. I know that uh, you're such a deep advocate for Bitcoin, so I want to thank you for that. And this it naturally creates a very small world network, you know. So there's a lot of people who are really working behind the scenes to help showcase Bitcoin, to help put it into a light that lets it be understandable because we're talking about very nuanced topics here, you know, that, um, you know, as a, uh, you know, for better, or worse number go up, it's a great selling point, you know? So we, so, uh, so, you know, like when you're digging into this, the, people that really find this stuff interesting that want to learn more about the background and stuff. Um, you know, and one example of that is someone, I believe his name on, uh, on X is electronic coin. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but it's Ryushi. Uh, Ryushi. So I want to give credit to Ryushi, Ryushi. Yeah. Who initially put this information out there and helped me become aware of it, which is that, um, you know, just recently the English, uh, uh, law commission, I think that's what they're called, but uh, in, their their name might come to me if 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 I got it wrong. Um, they put out a report called "Digital Assets: The Final Report." It was like "Digital Assets: Colon The Final Report." So like, you know, like that's a that, that's a pretty serious name right there for for a report. You know, I think it went on for around four years or something like this. It was a three hundred and nine page report. On, you know, and and the concept of the law commission, um, it, if I'm, I, I may be getting that name slightly wrong, but the, the concept of this is that in the early 1960s, uh, technology was beginning to show that it was going to innovate faster than government and law would be able to um, monitor it and maintain, you know, abreast of whether or not uh, it impacted existing laws. And uh, for example, you know, not to use a, a pie in the sky example, but imagine we can all fly or something like we suddenly have the ability to all fly. You know, we have these jaywalking laws, you know, how how do they relate to, you know, if you can fly over the, the, the you know, like the, this is things that, you know, you can't predict. Right. Because uh, human in, ingenuity and innovation will always outpace the ability to keep tabs on where, where it's actually uh, going to. And so. You know, so they had this idea to come up with this law commission and the law commission's job, it basically was being um, uh, maintained by these former barristers. So these are people with high degrees of proficiency in law. And in fact, law is their practice, but they are essentially like retired now. Um, and basically what they do is they um, they look at deeply uh, innovative technology and they evaluate whether or not it uh, it requires the, um, you know, the government of England to update or to make some statements about it. So they've they've been doing this since the 60s and they recently did this with regards to digital assets and Ryushi published it. It was wonderful. Um, so right the the law commission spent four years investigating digital assets just as a whole looking at it from all sides many different perspectives whether that's bitcoin ethereum you know proof of stake proof of work all of this various different stuff and uh the, i believe they cited craig's uh pending litigation etc something along the lines of 60 four times or something like that in terms of uh the amount of different times that they cited his specific case and they were making statements to the effect of, I'm not directly quoting, but something to the effect of, you know, if it were not for Dr. Wright having advanced this case this far, we would be years and years be behind in terms of our understanding of the degree of applicability of digital assets to the existing laws, et cetera. So 
the idea is that overwhelmingly favorable, overwhelmingly positive were the results of this 309 page report from these professional litigants, you know, um, and that that have deep ties to the courts because they've they've come from the courts, et cetera. So um, so that was something that I think is really uh, important to note, because when we talk about, you know, first of all, we're on we're we're bringing something new to the world, you know, and and the way in which um, the way in which this is being uh, portrayed and expressed in you know publications, et cetera. A lot of times, it's not being portrayed with the degree of nuance that it necessarily needs, you know, like um, and you know, an, an example could be uh, you know could be firearms or something like that, where we have something like uh, like the ability to own and possess firearms, et cetera. But, you know, what are the specific laws that we should adopt with regards to the responsibility that we have? So this is a, a tool of our own sovereignty, et cetera. So, but what, but what are the degrees to which we are willing to take on some, you know, some responsibility for the fact that we have this privilege? And, you know, so those are the things that I think are being fleshed out and being delved into in terms of this case, et cetera. And, uh, well, and well, things, well, which, yeah. Well, back to the, so there was like lots of cases. So I'm trying to, like one of the cases I'm trying to find out about, if you know more about, or the background on it, it seems like Dr. Wright lost maybe intentionally or had stolen from his computer a hundred thousand Bitcoin. Is that right? Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and then, so, so and then now that's going on. It's, I see how it's, it's kind of tying into what you're talking about, this regulatory framework potentially where it's blending together, but that doesn't have to do with the COPA trial, does it? The one uh, the, or does So no, it doesn't have to do with the COPA trial, but you know, my, my, I guess my thoughts and comments to, to draw into, you know, like uh, for, for on that specific topic, it's just that, you know, with with respect to Craig, you know, just like, uh, you know, he uses the example of the Jack the Ripper. Or it's not exactly Jack the Ripper, but the individual who was found with the five dollar bill, uh, um, you know, there was like a murder in England or something like that where the where the, where five dollars had been dropped behind or something. But it had actually been a very anal, uh, you know, person who recorded what serial numbers were distributed when they gave their cash payout. So they were able so the English police and this is this is precedent too. Uh, they were able to actually go back and find link this particular person. Didn't mean that just because they found it that he necessarily committed the crime, et cetera, but they were able to link him and it turned out that he did commit the crime uh, later on. So the idea is just that, you know, um, you know, that, that comes back to this concept of, of ownership. And so uh, the ability to be able to, um, to, uh, to reassign coins to basically the the rightful owner, uh, and we we that already exists, you know, um, with with you know existing property laws. So you know, like I'm on camera at uh you know um a nightclub with you or something like this. Like I take your hat off my head, put it on my head, walk out the door or something like this. Like it's very easy to to um to reassign that hat back to you. Uh, and but the the thing is that it just becomes like a like something that is that's a little bit different when we're talking about something that's digital something that's imaginary right because you know when you're talking about this uh this um especially when it's widely so misunderstood across the grand you know the the regular population etc let alone you know the um the governments who are a little bit slower to to even take a look at something like bitcoin um you know they're the the, the narrative that builds up around, you know, the population, the people that have adopted Bitcoin, et cetera, is, is, is more or less like, you know, like, Hey, you know, if, if you lose it, you lose it. That's just what happens. You know, it's just kind of the downside of having this, you, you know, this, um, uh, this purely free network. Right. And, and, uh, and it gets down to like our definitions of free. Right. So like in, in a, in a, um, you know, in a vacuum or something like this, like, you know, pure freedom, you know, doesn't, doesn't have any types of laws, right? Because I, we can just decide for ourselves whether or not I think that, uh, that, you know, you should be hanged for sleeping with my wife, or, you know, you should be, uh, hanged for spilling my, my, my drink at the bar or something like that, you know? So, um, you know, that, that gets back to this concept of vigilante justice that I think that, you know, that some people, 
hearken for and uh and think that is a better explanation or is a better portrayal of justice than maybe this this concept of a of a codified set of laws right because you know that that because you know because we are so in a way instinctual as human beings you know like we we come from a long line of 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 beings that weren't capable necessarily of critical thought and things like this right like in terms of evolution and stuff like you know so we so so critical thinking is is relatively new to to the species whereas instinctual thinking is much more ingrained in us so you know we instinctually feel a certain way about how something happened and we can you know we are our feelings are are justified about that and if that involves was me taking some vigilante justice to take uh, you know to set a a right a, a wrong into right then then you know that's that's my vision of freedom you know and then the the flip side of that is that 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 uh that it there's just you know that 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 that's dangerous essentially because you know we don't have a universal set of uh of principles to to abide by and and you know is it wrong for us to expect certain things of each other you know is it wrong for me to expect that you know you understand that you, you can't kill other people etc right um and uh and so i think all these things you know they the bitcoin narrative and the bitcoin questions uh, especially when we're talking about property and reassigning coins and stuff like this they get they get back into these ideas that are you know a little bit a little bit uh old and and that, that we've that we've had to sort of uh iterate on you know what do you think well it sounds like they're the craig's gonna try to set precedent possibly on the idea of uh reassigning property as bitcoin or, or bitcoin that he may have lost or uh, had taken from him and it if that's done I don't think it's been done yet. It, this this could be the first time that it would be done. And if it's done, then the court would order the nodes to reassign this to him. And then then it will be like, will the nodes follow the court's order? Or will they ignore the court's order? You know, or will yeah. we? So th th it's going to be really, uh, if I were an institutional guy or a private equity guy, like you talked about earlier on the sideline, I'd be wanting to find out, well, what's going to happen here? Because what if the nodes just totally ignore the court? We, right then that was a that won't work we can't that that's a that's a risk that we have to calculate for yeah but if the courts can be relied on to the fact of stolen or lost property in this particular you know new asset class or new new network it could open up an entirely new uh perspective an, an entirely giant i mean like you mentioned earlier the private equity side could then potentially come in because they're they're having to calculate that we you know if we get robbed or stolen or lost what do we do we don't have if it's just tough luck we're that's a that's a tough pill to swallow you know you have yeah. to have a solution yeah and you know sometimes I use this example maybe not the perfect example but you know imagine that I'm a uh, you know I work at Fenway Park you know, the, uh, the Red Sox and I'm a big baseball fan. I'm a big Red Sox fan, you know, and my job is I, you know, like a lot of old school baseball games, they still use those like little wooden boards that show you the score on the game, you know? So, you know, let's just say for the sake of discussion, we're in the world series, you know, and, and like ninth inning, you know, and, uh, Red Sox lose, you know, but I hang up, you know, a number in the last inning, you know, that shows that they won, you know? So uh, I can do that, you know, and, and uh, but, but the question is, is, is uh, people that are looking at, you know, let's say that you're a, a person in the stands and you're watching the game, right? You saw the game, but you look up at the score and you see, oh, actually we won by run. Look, the scoreboard keeper, he changed uh, the result or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> so the question is, is which is the result, right? You know, like the, are the newspapers, are they going to report the result that I hung up there just because, you know, I'm a big fan and I don't want to see my team lose or something like this. You know, it's, 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 uh, it, it, we don't live in a world where, where we get to, you know, uh, decide the things that, that, uh, you know, that, that we all witness, you know, like, uh, and, or, and if we do, 
um, you know, there, there's going to be a select few of pe people that will actually sort of follow along with us and, and, and agree, you know, and, and when you, when you have those people that, that they sort of feed each other their own, you know, like, oh, you know, we totally won that world series. Yeah, we won, you know, but like, you know, you have to keep that to a very small group of people because like, you know, you just talk to a normal person and they say, well, it doesn't matter what it said on the scoreboard at the end. You know, we all watched the game. We saw who won the game, et cetera. So, you know, I think that in the reason why I'm bringing that up is because you have this, um, this worry of maybe the nodes will put up a fake scoreboard or, you know, the courts determine that the, that the, uh, that the Bitcoins belong to Craig. Okay. It's like the equivalent of like, you know, everybody in the stadium watched that the, uh, you know, the such and such team won the game, et cetera. But, you know, one person hangs a score on their own scoreboard that says that the other team won, you know, and, and at the end of the day is the really, is the, you don't even have to pay attention to that, you know, like, because, you know, it's, it, it, the reality is, is that, uh, is that, you know, and, and this is for good or not. And a lot of people that have a problem with the fact that the courts would be would be making a decision on this matter. They have a problem not just with uh, with that in and of itself, but they have a problem with courts in general. Right. Because they just think, well, courts shouldn't be allowed to decide things. You know, those but, are the people who 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 support anarchy. And right. And what, right. Right. Yeah. Like but like want, no government anarchy, you know, they. they yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and they, they might have good reasons for thinking that, you know, they might sure. have some reasons that are really uh, validated and maybe courts in the past have gotten some things wrong. And maybe they say, look, in this most recent instance, this court got this wrong and therefore no court should uh, ever make a decision, you know, but it's like, you can't, you know, the fact that they got something wrong doesn't mean that they shouldn't make a decision, right? Like we have to understand the order of operations. And, uh, and if we truly want to move away from this concept of um of like you know including courts perspectives and opinions when it comes to matters of property and stuff like this then it doesn't matter what like proof of work won't be our light at least this is my opinion proof of work wouldn't be bright enough of a light to to uh get us out of that i think that that would be you know a world that would just be uh you know uh we would be going backwards. We would be going back into vigilante justice or might makes right. Um, and, you know, you have a group of people that decides, well, I don't really like Craig Wright. So we're going to decide that he doesn't get these coins, even if a court decides that they belong to him. Well, you know, like, is that freedom? Is that, you know, like, you know, yeah, you might hate courts, but like, you know, do you just get to be the arbiter of, uh, of, of what, what the, the the problem is that at least with courts okay for good or bad they might not be the best uh you know example of they, they might not always get the, the truth right but they, they at least you at least have the ability to redress grievances right like in most cases you have the ability to if they got something wrong you can file an appeal you can ask for a review of additional evidence etc and uh and so anything i think that um that you know, comes from this, it, it needs to begin from that and move us as a society forward. You know, I think, uh, I think the idea of shirking them entirely, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's just wrong from the start. So, you know, in that may be a good point for us to, to kind of go towards closing this out here and, and the court stuff that you mentioned, should people be at all interested or even, uh, well, maybe you can give kind of a background on what's going on with the, all the, the COPA situation and, and Dr. Wright and, uh, you know, your understanding of it and whether or not people should be concerned with it or interested in it. You know, like what what's the potential outcome of the of the situation um, that you see? Like what, what yeah. are the possible what are the possible outcomes that that could come about? Yeah, well, it's a. Um, I guess I'll start off by just talking a little bit about, I posted on X a, uh, a breakdown of, you know, planetary movements right now. And I don't know, did you happen to see my, my, uh, little, um, you know, dissertation on Pluto moving into Aquarius at all? Not yet. No. Well, I'll start off by just explaining how this came to my, to my consciousness. So, you know, I was doing a little bit of like, you know, meditation, a little bit of, uh, 
inquiry, self-inquiry into what's going on with the, you know, with the trial, with this period of time in Bitcoin's history, et cetera. And, um, and one of the things that came up, you know, I'm a big, uh, I really love the, the, the Zodiac. I love astrology. I think it teaches us a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, for those that aren't too familiar with, um, with astrology right now, I'm in, uh, I'm in Mexico, I'm in Cancun, Mexico. And the day before I left for Cancun, I was, me and a friend of mine were sitting in Philadelphia. We were looking up at the sky and we were having a conversation about, you know, astrology and, and the moon and the moon in the sky, you know, it was one of those ones where it was almost purely dark, but you could see this tiny sliver, right? And it looked like just kind of the edge of your thumb. Like it was just basically barely, barely a fingernail of a moon. And, uh, and so when I got all the way down here to Mexico, you know, I was, I was blown away to see that, you know, the, the sliver was still there. It was almost a day later. So it was the exact, almost the exact same size, maybe a little bit brighter, but, you know, it, instead of being, you know, facing the, the, it facing like a D, like the light part was facing a D it looked like a U right. So, and it just goes to show you the, the geography that, uh, of the earth, well, first of all, and that, that the, um, that the, the location that you're in really s significantly changes, you know, your relationship, uh, with the planets. And, you know, we're in, I'm in a place, the Yucatan that has a long history of studying, uh, the stars and the planets, the, the former, um, you know, rulers of the Yucatan, Yucatan area were the astronomers and the astrologers that were keeping guard of the stars, we're following them to figure out what patterns existed in, uh, in their world, you know? And so, uh, so I was, I was, uh, you know, interested in the way in which, uh, astrology fit in with this period in Bitcoin's history. And one of the things I did was I reached out to a close astrologer friend of mine. Uh, I've long time been a fan of a guy named Rob Bresny, B-R-E-Z-S-N-Y. Uh, he runs a column called freewillastrology.com. So if you haven't gotten a chance to check that out, maybe swing over, take a look just at what your week's horoscope is. I always, I find it fascinating. Um, and I encourage you, you know, just get you thinking about stuff. Um, and so was uh, talking with his wife, uh, uh, another astrologer named Ro, and she brought to my attention that Pluto is moving into Aquarius. So Pluto is one of the old or one of the uh, the it's the farthest you know planet outside of the uh, sun. So it takes the longest naturally to get all the way around the sun. So typically when it goes through a new sign, it'll be 20, 25 years before it gets through a new sign to the degree to which, you know, when I was born uh, in 81, it moved into, I believe, uh, Scorpio in 83 Sagittarius sometime close to 2000 and you know Capricorn not long after that the point is that it's been through three signs in my entire life's history you know and uh and I was surprised and, and so she brought to my attention she said something to the effect of you know Pluto is a big disruptor of power cycles and power structures and the most recent structure that it it has been moving through was Capricorn so Capricorn's an earth structure and it relates to finances, especially global finance, you know? So, uh, so I was interested to see like, oh, wow, interesting. Pluto is coming out of this period where it's moving through a global, you know, it's, it's theoretically according to, to her disrupting this global power, uh, structure, uh, relating to global finance. And it's about to move into this new, uh, sign, which is Aquarius, and, you know, a lot of people are familiar with this concept of we're moving into the age of Aquarius. There's a lot of really interesting information for people to check out about that uh, by a guy named Randall Carlson. If you look into like ancient time signatures and things like that, you can find out some information about that from Randall in some of his uh, recent YouTube videos. But uh, but Aquarius is a, is a much more humanitarian sign. It's a brotherhood of man. It's that, you know, golden rule, do unto others type of thing that we were talking about before. So I was interested to see, you know, where where Pluto entered into Capricorn. And would you believe that Pluto entered into Capricorn just in between the time that the white paper was released on October 31st back in 2008? And when the first block was mined. So so for the entirety of Bitcoin's history, Pluto has been in this Capricorn sign where it's been disrupting the uh, the global financial structures, right? 
the last time that Pluto moved through Capricorn and concluded its reign in Capricorn and moved into the humanitarian sign of, of, uh, of Aquarius – was 1776 <laughs> you know so we're talking about it, it it doesn't happen that often it's 246 years it takes for it to get all the way around its cycle etc but you know this is something that um you know when when this occurs at least historically you know there is a there is an air where it's about you know the preservation of liberty the establishment of liberty things that we associate with the american revolution um, and and so I couldn't help but think about that with respect to Dr. Wright and his and his recent COPA trial, you know, because, you know, of course, um, disrupting the power structures, you know, they have become, you know, they've become, you know, like central pillars of the foundation of our of our uh, society, of our building, but they're rotted, right? They're termite ridden. They are barely even supporting, you know, this. And the reality is, is that all of us are living underneath this roof, right? Of our, uh, of, of our um, global society. So, you know, so the, these central pillars, they, they aren't just uh, something that you can sort of just laugh off or write off or anything like this, like the, the integrity of of um you know our our global power structures is extremely important to preserving our liberty etc as as uh as agents within this network so i so i couldn't help but think about that as uh as we're moving in you know it's just about i think on january 20th is when pluto officially enters it'll be in uh aquarius all the way through uh through mid-September, right around the fall equinox, and it'll get back into it a little bit closer to Halloween, and it'll be there till 2043. So once once it goes back in Halloween of this year. So, you know, I can't say exactly what is going to happen out of, you know, the trial with COPA, et cetera, um, but I can say that the ideas which are being tested are extremely important. I think that they are representative of two different ways of thinking of things. Um, and one represents sort of like more of a Silicon Valley way of thinking of things, which I think we talked about earlier in our talk, which which represents more of a web of life perspective, which is, you know, the decentralized uh, it, it, yeah, web of life. Yeah, yeah, it's centralized. It's 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 let's have lots of different nodes so we can say it's decentralized, but let's have a single narrative that we're actually propagating through the network using all of these various different nodes. Let's make it highly connective so that we can get this message all around the network as fast as possible, but let's not actually allow differences of opinion. Let's not allow uh, challenging of this authoritative per authoritative perspective. And uh and I think that, you know, that is the narrative that's being represented by the COPA side. I think it's the narrative that uh, Craig Wright was born to destroy. He is hell bent on, on destroying that. And, um, and if he has to invent a brand new electronic cash system to destroy that, that's just part of the, you know, that's just part of the, the work that's involved, you know um, you know, so, so I really think, and, and I think that if you really look at Craig and for those that are, uh, that are not familiar with Craig, I really encourage you to get deep into his um, lectures, into his talks. He gives some great talks through presentations uh, that even just this year with N-Chain um, master classes. He does amazing lectures with Xiao Wei Lu from S-Script, who's a very good friend of yours. And um, and he also has the Ryan X Charles uh, conversations that he does where he explains the entirety of the white paper. And, you know, the thing is that with Craig, with Dr. Wright, um, you know, at the end of the day, I really evaluate people. I don't, you know, like a lot of people, you know, it's, it's, it's neither here nor there if he's a Toshi, because at the end of the day, what he's saying is what I actually find valuable. I don't find him to be valuable just because he's this or just because he's that, because, you know, there's, there's lots of different times that people that have great positions of, of, uh, of honorific titles, et cetera, turn out to be terrible people with terrible ideas. Right. And, uh, and so no, no idea of Craig's gets a free pass just because he's Satoshi. Um, really, it doesn't matter whether he created it or not. It's really, you know, just evaluate him based on the merit of, of his, of his ideas. And, uh, and I think that, you know, we're entering the, the reason why I brought up that, that foray into about Pluto and Aquarius is that I think that 
you know, if history is a precedent and if this time period where Pluto is moving through these through this particular planetary cycle does bear global significance, like similar to, you know, 1776 when it last passed through that sign, um, you know, we have no idea. You could never in a million years look at what happened in 1771 or 1772 and predict, you know, 1995 or predict, you know, 2024, et cetera, you know, the, but, but what you can do and what I think makes Craig that, you know, like, I'm very thankful that I think that he will win is that, you know, if you, if you abide by time honored principles and truths, you're not trying to use a new technology to reinvent a wheel or something, but really what you're doing is you're using a new technology to give a greater voice to it, to a much more time honored way that we need to operate in this world that we have responsibility that we have have to uh, work you know like um the 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 value of work uh, is is so prevalent in the bitcoin and the bsv community you know it's work for its own sake work for its own reward um you know and that i think that you know again we're not we're not you know we we have the the long work ahead of us of of rebuilding this society um into something that we want to pass down to our grandchildren but I think that uh, that we we abide by those principles, those time honored principles, and that we will come out ahead. Sounds like you're you're hopeful, and you're 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 thinking that he will win. And you know, if he does win, what is the uh, what is the effect of that? Yeah. So well, I think would, that what would that do? I mean, it, it's hard for me to imagine that because you know, again, like we talked a little bit about, you know. Uh, not getting too far ahead of yourself in terms of, you know, the, um, the, the, the things that you're imagining, because sometimes you, they become like binds, right? Like, so Craig talks a little bit about Plato, he, or he talks a lot about Plato and in the Plato's myth of the cave, right? You go down from the daylight into the underworld, right? And you watch the projection of the uh, fire casting shadows on the wall. And you imagine that those shadows are a reality, right? So, um, so when we imagine, you know, what are the effects that will come of this and, and stuff like this, it, it, you know, it, in some ways, what that is, is that, that actually kind of like, uh, binds you, right. Because you, you get this idea of, okay, well, I want that at all costs. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I want to see this, the effects, the positive ripple effects of Craig winning his lawsuits. I want to, I want to see that at all costs. And then sometimes it <laughs> leads you to, uh, to, to take some questionable actions, right. Because you're like, well, you know, like, uh, I really want um, uh, you know, freedom to prevail, but if it won't prevail on its own, then I want to like demand it or institute it or like, you know, decree it. And it's like, no, you've just done the wrong thing, right? Like it was a good intention, but it, it was like, you allowed your, your want to see that arise to sort of, um, to sort of take you away from the thing that you wanted, you know? So, so, um, but if I allow my, so I don't spend a lot of time imagining it, but you know, if I allow myself to imagine it, you know, what I am at, what I see is that, you know, that he's universally recognized as the creator of Bitcoin, that his ideas are, are adopted and given critical thinking and serious thought, you know, and, uh, and you see this, you know, like, it's not to say that institutional adoption necessarily uh, legitimizes anything, right? Because we know that institutions, can you know just be like ostriches with their head in the sand right and and as long as they're you know so but at the same time there is something to be said for the world's uh you know br the other brilliant people of the world you know understanding that there's more to what's being displayed here than just uh you know this is a crazy guy from australia that claims to have invented bitcoin but everyone knows is uh <laughs> is is just trying to get satoshi's coins or something like this like i want i want honest you know like people that care about the truth and care about liberty and things like this to evaluate him on his ideas, not on, you know, um, his accolades or, or anything like that, because I think his ideas uh, make so much sense to me. I think that they've, they've helped me um, learn my place within a very complicated world. And I think the same would be true for, for other people that, that uh, think critically about what he says. Wow. 
Sounds, I mean, that's that's a really a deep subject. I mean, you know, speaking of his accolades, I mean, as in, in closing here, if we could route, I, I'm just wondering if you know of actually what is, how many degrees does he even have? Do you even know? Have you, have no, you I'm not sure, but I think, or... I think uh, what last I heard, you know, he doesn't consider anything uh, below a master's degree to be a degree. <laughs> so like, <laughs> you know, so when we're talking about degrees, you know, he's probably has lots of bachelor's degrees, but he doesn't even qualify. Those don't even qualify as a degree. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe two or three doctorates as far as I know. Um, and uh and then, um, you know, roughly 20 to 30, 27 to 34 master's degrees. I, he's completed a few recently. So those numbers are growing. But uh, but I'll tell a quick story um, since since we're we're on the subject of his degrees yeah. that I was very lucky. You know, when I did this thing with uh, with, you know, be, going from being a bartender and just getting inspired by a lot of this subject matter and then, you know, putting my neck out there, seeing if someone would hire me, finding someone that would hire me and like really uh one of the first things i did was i head, headed out to uh to zug uh and uh and um zurich switzerland to attend the zurich uh coin geek conference and um you know met with like constantin uh Zikantos, uh from um you know he he recently spoke on the satoshi x uh platform with ian grig i met ian grig out there um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, one of the people that I met out there, what, and, you know, this was, this was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in this hotel, don't know anybody from anybody. And I bump into Jack Pitts, uh, equity diamonds and, you know, we hit it off and he's from Bucks County. I'm from Philadelphia area. So we have a nice, um, a nice, uh, you know, connection through, through where we grew up, et cetera. And, you know, we just start wandering around like, you know, uh, Switzerland, we end up bumping into Ian Grigg, um, uh, Constantinos, Gantos, uh, and, um, and I think, uh, we also bumped in with to Stas, uh, Stas Toshi, the creator of the Stas protocol was, was there. Um, and, uh, and Bernard, uh, Bernard Mueller, um, Bitcoin Ben, sometimes they refer to him by, and Bitcoin Ben or Ben Bernard Mueller, uh, he was, you know, Swiss, Swiss, no, he, yeah, he's Swiss German. And so, but, he, but he's from Switzerland. And so he had a lot of context and background to, you know, the people of Switzerland and their culture and, you know, um, and what it was like to, you know, because he's been a Bitcoiner, he's like a lifer, you know, so he saw, you know, the various different ways in which the narratives were shifting, et cetera, through the different, um, you know, as the years went by and as more and more information about Satoshi and Craig eventually came out, et cetera. And, uh, and so, you know, <laughs> Ben said, okay, well, uh, well, you know, cause, cause, you know, he was originally part of like a Swiss Bitcoin association or something like that, which I think still is in existence. And, uh, and, you know, the Bitcoin association at that point wanted to do a proper, there was someone that was really, antagonistic and didn't like Craig at all. So Ben said, you know, the Swiss way is to host a debate, you know, like if you have a disagreement, you know, they're very, they're very forward people, you know, if they, if they have a question about something, Hey, let's just hash it out. We'll have a public debate about it. And if you have a problem with Craig and you think that, you know, that he's lying about his degrees or whatever, then, then, uh, then, then let's get a, uh, a conversation started. So they hosted this big debate and they, they invited everyone in and Craig agreed to fly in. And, um, and so and Ben was going to moderate the debate, you know? And so, so, uh, Craig said, well, what do you think he's going to ask me? And he said, well, he said, I can't tell you what he's going to ask you because, you know, it's that's part of the rules of the debate. But I will tell you that, you know, it's probably what all the small blockers say, like your degrees are fake and, you know, this, that and the <laughs> other. So he said, you know, maybe one thing that would be funny is like, you know, if you plan, if you prepare that he's going to tell you that your degrees are fake, maybe you just bring them all, you know? So, so he said, uh, he said, well, what do you mean bring them all? And he said, yeah, I could give you like my father-in-law's wheelbarrow. And like, you know, like you can put all your degrees in the wheelbarrow and wheel them out on stage, et cetera. So, so uh, he, he's telling me the story while we're sitting at like kind of a pub in, in Switzerland. And yeah, if you go on YouTube and look up, um, you know, Craig Wright wheelbarrow degrees. You can see Ben giving the lecture and the guy is saying like, 
to, you know, he goes into this, the whole thing and you claim that you have this many degrees, but I, I don't actually know if that's true. No one's ever seen them in person. And then Craig says something along the lines of, Oh, speaking of that, like, by the way, uh, I have something here and they wheelbarrow his degrees out, you know, and they're all framed and they're all in glass. And like, he had to take them all off his office wall and fly them. And some of them, the glass broke in the, uh, in the degree in the, while in transit, et cetera. But Ben took the time, you know, to, to photograph every single one and make a PDF. And he has that available uh, for people to review as part of, you know, the, 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 the YouTube page or something like that. I think you're able to access the, the actual degrees, et cetera, but yeah, they're, you know, like those are old, old, uh, you know, straw man arguments that they use to try to, um, to try to uh, get you to not pay attention to him. But you know, those, uh, those have been proven many, many, many times over now. <laughs> and he's also besides just his degrees he's the most credentialed it's you know the degrees are one thing because he does the degrees for fun you know but his business is security and he's the most credentialed security expert in the world it's not even close like if you look at his credentials you know they're mind-blowing on sec on security he's the yeah, on, highest on... credentialed security expert in the world absolutely absolutely a lot of question yeah. yeah and without question is uh, there and, um you know, one of the one of the narratives I'd really love to get your perspective on, and we're going long now, but this is super interesting here is um okay, this is like so much here. Like it seems like um someone or the other side may have gone to such lengths to getting to to potentially take down this this network to actually hire or plant Christian Christian uh the Viking, you know, whatever his last name is into engine. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that, I don't, that, that's speculation, but, but apparently, you know, that was like a, a possible way. And now uh, apparently according to Christian Craig had done all admitted to all sorts of fraud and he had, you know, for, admitted to forging all sorts of things. And there's this narrative on that. That's coming. That's going to come out in court. You got one side saying that he, he has admitted to all this forgery and fraud and all these things. And then, you know, it's yet to be determined. So I'm just wondering about how this forgery and fraud comes to light. Cause it doesn't seem to really fit um, with, with being the leading, the world's leading security expert to then yeah. doing all sorts of fraud. So I'm just kind of wondering if you can shed some light on that. <clears throat> yeah. Well, not just that. I mean, but also just listen to what Craig talks about, right? He talks about an honest system. Like he, he just, advocates for an honest system over and over and over again he wants to build bitcoin to be a ledger of truth so that records can't be tampered with i mean and that's exactly what it is you know so like so it's just so funny because the like the uh, you know what they're trying to throw at him as being this like you know serial tamperer of information is just like you know it's serial, like, yeah the narrative yeah. is i think serial forger is a right. serial forge forging expert yeah. Yeah. And then you just ask yourself, OK, like, why? Why? Why is he forging all of this information? You know, like and uh, and yeah, there's no there's there's really like no explanation for that. It's not to um, you know, he's not asking for any money. There's so many, uh, you know, like riffs or, you know, out there, griffs out there with like people trying to. Uh, convince you of things like he's not trying to convince anyone of anything uh he just wants bitcoin to to uh be understood from the ground up and to be under and recognized as a uh, as the system that he created it as so you know like you just get these wildly inconsistent and it's so funny because sometimes when you really need to skew something you know like you have to you have to um go like all the way the 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 other side of it right so like craig is someone who is like you know extremely focused on the truth extremely focused on um making sure there's accountability uh data integrity all these things and so the way that you try to attack that is to, to just you know like say that oh he's he's just he's just trying to uh to you know he's a serial forger etc you know and um and so yeah like it, none of it has ever made any sense to me um and uh and you know the what i can say about you know craig is that uh craig has mentioned that he believes that 
he has them in what you would call a royal fork or something like this. So the uh, the chess term when you have, you know, a knight that is attacking both the king and the queen, et cetera, and they call it a, a royal fork. Um, so and, you know, Craig has been very upfront that uh, that this is the exact outcome that he's wanted, that he uh, that, you know, he doesn't, um, you know, recognize uh the court of public opinion he recognizes the court of uh you know the higher courts of the uh, established countries and so he has been like i think yearning and looking for an opportunity to share this uh this information the other thing that i'll mention again i'm not an expert on any of craig's trials or anything like that but you know you have like previous trials like he had with uh with magnus uh, you know, Garen, Hoddle not. Uh, yeah, hot or not. And, and of course, Magnus is from Norway. The Viking you were talking about is from Norway as well. Fishman from Norway. He used to call himself, um, you know, uh, you know, in, in that trial, you know, it really wasn't about, uh, about Satoshi. It was just about whether or not hot lot was, uh, was, you know, lot, you know, committing libel. You know, so um, so we really haven't seen and and the uh the trial the climate trial in Florida. You know, both both uh both parties agreed from the outset that Craig is Satoshi, which I think anyone that properly evaluates the information they will arrive at the same conclusion that Craig is clearly Satoshi. Um, you know, it it's just also I don't want to use like anecdotal evidence in terms of, but like you know. If you live, you know, you grew up in this world, you know, like when you're young, maybe it's hard to determine who's a fraud and who's not, you know, because it's very easy to be swayed by a really convincing opinion or a really charming person or something like that. Right. It's you can it's easier when you're younger to to fall victim to some people that want you to believe a certain thing. But you listen to Craig and like he just does. It doesn't sound like a fraud right like he's he's fully transparent he'll tell you anything you want to know you know he doesn't try to change the subject you know like frauds they want you they want to change the subject when you start you know getting into very difficult to address topics and stuff i've always found craig to be someone that and if you look through his um you know he's obviously he's been so uh gracious with his time that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that you know the guy has has devoted the last like you know 10 years or whatever to just continuously answering the same questions over and over and over again and he does it in light because he knows that that he is a channel he's a channel to spread awareness about bitcoin if he wasn't doing it like let's say craig and first of all craig has lots of money you know like he if he was the type of person that only cared about getting rich off of a scheme or something like this you know like he could have walked off into the sunset a long time ago and just said you know what uh these this generation of time they weren't ready for my invention of bitcoin i'm i'm just gonna ride off into the sunset with my billions of dollars and you know i have and and he said that as much too he said if if i wanted you know to uh to try to run a grift or something like that believe me i could have done it a lot like better way than try to argue that i'm satoshi this is the only one that pretty much the only method that you could do that is like universally like the needle comes off the record, everybody stops, you know, like, you know, and uh, so, so it's the worst possible way that he could do it. If he was really trying to run some sort of grift for, for money, it's not what he's doing. You know, he clearly is just the most educated person on the planet uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, Bitcoin, you can get it like, you know, you only need to listen to them, say six or seven sentences before it's before that much is clear. And the, the other thing is that's so interesting about Craig is that he's not just um, so. So Bitcoin, you know, it, it, because it's such a novel technology, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of smart people that come into Bitcoin, but they want to use the system to do what they want, right? They go, okay, well, we can take the system and then we just fudge this part and erase this part and do this. And then we can start using it to, uh, you know, do all the things that we want to do, make it, you know, money a little less transparent and stuff like this. Craig's the opposite. Money needs to be transparent. We need to have a public ledger. But, you know, uh, 
it needs to be, you need to be able to hide it in the fire hose. So the only time you don't want information that's so publicly, that's why identity is firewall because, you know, you don't want information that, uh, that, um, you know, that, that anybody that has a Google search can look up and see what, you know, what movies I rented last night, you know, because like then all of a sudden, if we can do that, then you have people that move into power that don't like certain topics or certain subjects or something. And they start, you know, coming after people that are representing ideas that they don't agree with, et cetera. You know, you don't want that, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's hard, but but the concepts that Craig is advocating for, this concept of stewardship, this concept of accepting responsibility, of taking the ownership of, okay, you want freedom? Great. Guess what? It's not like all it's cracked up to be, right? It's not just, you know, like uh, sugar plums and gumdrops. You know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes in with that freedom that you claim that you want so bad. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that the character that he represents, it's perfectly consistent with the uh, with the innovation and, and invention of Bitcoin, it's a it's a global truth ledger. It's the it's clear that it's the most important thing to him that he's willing to sacrifice anything for it, including his own reputation. And, you know, at the end of the day, we are, uh, you know, they say that the mountain is clear from the plains. Sometimes you have to step away in order to see the importance and the significance. Um, many times I think Craig could have walked away. But our entire species owes him a massive debt of gratitude because of just how um, how basically persistent he is and how truly much he cares about not just making money. He does he doesn't care about that at all. I'm sure he cared about it when he was younger to a greater degree than now, but he cares about leaving a legacy. And uh, and to be frank, I think uh, the Viking can't hold his jock strap. <laughs> very good and it, and it sounds like you mentioned that he uh that one analogy uses it craig has him in a not a checkmate but craig believes it's a what a check a royal fork a royal yeah. fork and that's a chess move yeah it's a chess move so i think what he's saying is that he has them uh you know by them suing him uh that that's exactly what he wanted he got you know like he was you know, able he, to trigger the outcome that he wanted yeah. by 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 invoking this litigation, and that's interesting. Yeah. That you bring that up because it's actually one of the. Uh, so when that happened, he then created these countersuit arguments to tie them in. So then, it it's too late for them to give up. Like, like one of the angles you could say, well, well, Copa can just give up and say, well, we'll dismiss. We're not going to sue Doctor Wright anymore. But it's too late for that. That outcome right. has already passed. It's it's no turning back. And so like one angle of the case could be like, well, Dr. Wright could always settle and we never know. And he just gets paid money in the background. But it seemed like that's, that's a possibility. But it seems like at no cost will Dr. Wright settle. Like no matter how much money they offer him to, they, they're right at trial. The jury's about to make, they're ready to make a decision. They say a billion dollars, take it. You know, I, it seems like he's not willing to settle no matter, no matter what. I mean, I, I, is that your impression? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He is, you know, really fixated on uh, the larger, the larger um, implications. And so when we talked about that law commission report, the 309 page report that was produced by the English commission on law um, that cited Dr. Wright's tulip, uh, tulip um trust uh tulip trading i forget exactly what the case is that they cited uh but they cited it something like 64 times or something like that very favorably and um you know that is what he's looking to do he's someone who is uh you know he oftentimes talks about the importance of the wesleyan perspective um you know and uh and um andrew carnegie as a great example of that andrew carnegie went out into the a private sector and you know he he had carnegie steel um you know monumentally successful and uh but but um you know he he reinvested the private money into um you know things that were of public benefit you know but but really when what you're what you're talking about is the intersection between you know the ability to um to you know 
uh, to take advantage of the value of private uh, of, of, of basically the like capitalism, you know, the ability to to pursue things for um, the betterment of mankind by pursuing things that are for the betterment for yourself and your family, you know, and um, and I think that no greater example of someone who who uh, really uh, straddles that line in, in it's a complex line um, very, uh, very very uh, successfully than Dr. Wright. He, um, you know, he's setting up Bitcoin so that it can be, you know, a system that will uh, benefit the people who contribute the most value to it. But at the end of the day, even if we aren't those people that contribute the most value to Bitcoin, we will still also benefit from its being in existence because of just of the sheer fact that it's like we're using capitalism as a battery for the rest of the globe. Right. And I think that, yeah. that Craig really truly feels that, that, and, and, you know, when I, we talked earlier in the conversation about one of my first um, forays to Craig, Wright To Dr. Wright being the Bitcoin and beyond video where he's going through this Connor Murray is his name. He was on a Bitcoin show with his brother. It was called the Bitcoin boys, I think. And, uh, and he did a, an episode called the Craig Wright timeline. Yeah. Go back and watch that. He does. He, he talked, uh, Craig has a conversation with Julian Assange, you know, from, um, WikiLeaks, et cetera. Like, uh, they had a debate about, you know, about the importance and value of capitalism to, um, to emerging, you know, global standards of living and things like this. And the, this is something that, uh, that is really, truly passionate about Craig and, and he he needs to to see this be understood on a global level, a global by courts, by you know magistrates, by you know um, barristers, uh, governors, etc. They they need to understand that just because it's distributed, just because it's digital, and just because consensus is being derived from multiple different um, central locations, doesn't mean that it's outside of the the realm of law because at the end of the day that's the only way that we're going to build a network that scales and the network that scales is the key to unlocking the true human potential yeah thank you brett and and just to, in closing this this video is definitely going to be uh this is actually this is a going to be like a culminating factor as we lead up into this uh, trial on um, you've you've really helped me unlock some of the um narratives behind Craig and break through the walls as to the possibilities of what's going to happen um, in, you know, in the narrative of, especially in that chess narrative that you mentioned, because it makes complete sense, uh, you know, in a legal structure, how he's got them to come forward and sue, sue him now. And by him suing them, they, they cannot withdraw. They can no yes. longer retreat. They've come to the battlefield and it's now, now they have to fight. They cannot not fight. And the only way they could get out from fighting, okay, which right. we cannot control is him settling. So we don't have control over that. We know we know that that's a possibility, but by, you know, this whole narrative that we've discussed today and you knowing Craig personally and, and having a better, you know, better understanding of what I've seen is he will die before he settles. It yeah. seems like it's till death do it. You know, it's, it's no matter what the amount of money is, no amount of money, it seems like we'll let him settle. And if that's the case, then, you know, I'm convinced that uh, even with the corruption of the court on the uh, side of possibility, total corruption and the other side pays off all the judges, let's just assume that's going to happen. Even with that happening, assuming it will, well, according to the current record and what's already happened in the case and the appeal, it's already gone back on, on, on preliminary issues. Then the case will be decided on appeal and it will yes. come back on appeal, you know, and the merits of the case will be determined that he will be determined to be Satoshi. That's my prediction is that it will be determined on appeal and that he will lose at the trial court level. That's my prediction only because of the, the fact of the corruption being so possible. Let's hope that it's not, um, but that's a possibility, you know? So that's the only narrative that we, we can't, you know, control. So. Yeah. 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 Well, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I fully agree. And, you know, I think that he's, he's, uh, you know, a stick in the mud. Um, he's, uh, fighting for what he feels is right 
and uh we all get to benefit from that you know yeah. um and uh and you know the thing is that that it's it's i, I don't want to say it's ideological because i don't think that he an ideological perspective requires you to believe in a uh process over and above results you know i think that craig is results oriented i don't think he believes in processes but the thing is that uh he needed to to create bitcoin to give humanity a set of tools that will allow them to create their the results that are best for them like he, the best example i can use and maybe it's a it's a stretch for an analogy but like you know a dog you know you give a you you leave a bunch of chocolate around and that dog is going to eat all that chocolate and it will not be happy about it in about you know like an hour or so right because chocolate and dogs do not mix you know uh but but the dog doesn't know that the chocolate is bad for it right it just sees the chocolate it goes after it you know well well same with with humanity you know you give us these uh tools like you know silicon valley like uh you know the ability to um to spy on all of uh all electronic communications you know we're going to do it you know um and and but it's bad for us it creates bad uh, it creates bad, you know, uh, conditions for our ingenuity, for our creativity, for our honesty, for our integrity, right? We become, we become, we have to uh, go, we sort of have to, um, to, you know, uh, to, to just accept the lowest common denominators among all of us, right? Because that's what we're all functioning on, you know? And I think that Craig truly understands that, you know, he has to, he, you know, he, and, and that's why he made Bitcoin transparent. So he, he talks about this e-gold being a precedent to, uh, to, um, to Bitcoin and, and Liberty Reserve. And, you know, if you listen to some of his talks with Ryan X Charles, you know, he, he names about 12 different precedents that have come before Bitcoin that all failed because they, they made it too uh too difficult to to keep track of where money was coming from and where money was going to so his big innovation is really just firewalling that that identity component um so that uh so that you know we we are able to get the benefits and the values of electronic cash like even if you go back to um Milton Friedman you know Milton Friedman is is talking in like the eighties or something about the electronic cash that it's a big, you know, uh, what's doesn't exist now, but it is coming, you know? Um, and, and this is Craig's passion. Uh, I think that he intuits that capitalism itself is a key, um, is a key, you know, it's, it's the nutrients that a society needs and, um, and that it's, and, but when, when things are too driven by a monolithic entity, like George Gilder was critiquing in life after Google, when it's too driven by a monolithic entity, then the nutrients become stripped down. They don't become, you're not getting that raw organic, uh, elements of the food. You're getting the processed elements of the food as a society. And so we're getting the homogenized views of, of, of what, you know, of, of capitalism, we're getting a, a single perspective on capitalism when the concept of capitalism is that it's really empowering the best agents to bring their their uh what they have to the market and so i really think that this is his love letter bitcoin is craig wright's love letter to capitalism and and his love letter to humanity because he sees that if we don't get the ability to um to have an open ec economic system that goes across borders but that doesn't encourage crime and doesn't encourage you know sex trafficking and all of these terrible things you want money that can that can be instant to transfer but it's not something that is being going to be wanted by you know a you know to be frank a decrepit you know group of entrenched power and uh and he talked craig talks about that a lot he says you know what i'm doing is removing the power from money um so what it does is it enables money like you know like blood in the body it needs to circulate you don't just you don't just hoard your blood in your fingertips or your you know it needs to be moving all the time all the time all the time and craig talks about this he's first of all craig is the wealthiest human being on the planet and Yet you listen to his 
thoughts on life. I'm sorry, excuse me, on wealth. And they're the most profound thoughts of all time. And he, he says, you know what wealth is? Wealth is haircuts. You know, like who, when would you have ever thought in your wildest imaginations that the wealthiest person on the planet would describe wealth as a haircut, but he's, he's absolutely correct. Wealth is not what you're hoarding, what you're stealing, what you're pulling away from the system, like a vampire, like blood, you know, someone who's obsessed with, so obsessed with blood circulating that they want to pull it out and just hoard it into these little vials or tubes, et cetera. You know, no, it needs to be circulating all the time and it needs to be, you know, um, it needs to be a benefit to all. And if the, if the money is too impeded by these big institutions like a Twitter now X that's able to, you know, to rewrite the narrative on what truth is to filter what uh, is acceptable truth and what's unacceptable truth, etc. You know, what you're doing is you're having a and, and that's why I think, you know, and, and if there is, is some way that I can use this to make a wake up call to people like Elon Musk and people like you know, um, Lex Friedman, who and Joe Rogan and some of these people yeah. who they so strongly believe in all of these ideas. And here you have this champion of them like Craig Wright, you know, but they they're too, you know, like for as much as they carve their names out as being, oh, we're the intellectual dark web. But, you know, we're unafraid. Jordan Peterson, I'm unafraid of the, uh, you know, to take on the establishment. Yeah, but he's not talking about Craig and he's not talking about no. the fight that Craig's taking on against these yeah, Silicon they're still, Valleys. They're still they're, being, they're right involved in the scam. I mean, just as much so as anybody else. And and maybe innocently, maybe totally innocently, just yeah. they've been, they've been, they've been bamboozled, you know? I mean, it takes it takes like a true awakening, like it takes like a really a deep dive to to get past the narrative on BTC. And because that's why even, I mean, even yeah. like, you know, Joe Rogan or, or Lex Friedman or these guys. Oh, BTC, you know, it's a big like, period. That's it's like it's like a whole different layer, you know, yeah. getting past that narrative. Um, well, it's it's why people like you are so important, what you're doing, shedding light. And the thing is that you're not coming in here. Uh, I don't want to speak for yourself, but, you know, I think that other people that watch you would agree that you're not coming in here with an agenda or with a, you know, you're not uh, coming in here trying to get people to leave at the end of your show with a certain perspective. You're just asking questions. You're just you're just curious about the topic. I think that, you know, you see the significance of this opportunity. I mean, not opportunity, but this moment in history where these ideas are being tested in public light with very large institutions, corporations. You have, you know, the who's who, you know, Square, Jack Dorsey, Kraken, uh, Sam Altman, the creator of OpenAI, you know, these, this, uh, this, this, you know, Coinbase, Facebook, you know, like the, biggest, the biggest BTC <laughs> promoter in the world. Right. And then Craig Wright, like the like the one is David versus Goliath, you know, it, it and, really and is. nobody is drawing attention to this besides you. And, you know, <laughs> Zhao Wei Lu is doing a lot to uh, to show that what's so, possible yeah, it here. It seems so. like it's just no nobody's drawing attention to it. You're right. It's yeah. like such a it's just. I, I mean, yeah, I can't think of a bigger case with bigger companies involved and more at stake, it seems like in our yeah. lifetime. Yeah. You know, so. Well, the reason why no one's paying attention to it is because he's just a scammer. But, you know, <laughs> Rafael Laverde, uh, who I just ta had an interview with today before you, man, this guy. Oh, is I can't amazing. wait. To, I'm going to drop it yeah. today. So it's amazing. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. But he said, you know, like, like, why would you take on Craig unless he was a true real threat, right? Like if he was just some guy that was standing on a soapbox on the street corner, waving a newspaper at people saying, I invented Bitcoin, you know, like <laughs> ah, just leave him alone. Like you don't have to get Facebook and Coinbase and, you know, all these people to sue him all as a collective unit, you know, but you also have this, this, uh, this concept of whether, you know, like, patents it the we didn't talk about this yet but maybe we can have another call uh in the lead up to the trial where we talk about the concept of patents in general May, you know because this open patent alliance they want to uh to get rid of the concept of patents you know but only the ones that craig has let's let's leave all the ones that we have you know so 
So yeah, that'll be a, a, a let's let's save that for another discussion. I really uh, that that's almost like a panel discussion. The concept of the patents. I mean, that's like a really going to be a deep subject, and 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 how it all plays into this entire. I guess you'd call it like a chess strategy that's been developed, um, you know, behind the scenes on this entire narrative, you know, absolutely uh, very interesting. Well, thank you, Brett. I, it looks like it's getting dark out there in Cancun. So, you know, I really appreciate your time today. It was really good, good to get to know you better. And I uh, look forward to doing this again sometime and, um, you know, seeing you again soon at the next conference as well. Yeah, it's such a pleasure. I want to thank you so much for being such a strong advocate for Bitcoin, for being such a, a openly curious person, just trying to um, make sense of the world around you and processing and filtering those thoughts for an audience that's also trying to learn along the way. Uh, as I mentioned before, I, you know, I really relied on um, channels like your own when I was first trying to figure out my way um, through this because, you know, you read a lot of headlines and it's important to be able to get into the the context and the nuance of that intellectual subject matter. And so, you know, thank you so much for what you're doing. And yeah, I look forward to. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you. And lastly, where can people find, uh, find you, uh, you know, or reach you? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll just, you know, really quickly let everyone know that I am on Twitter and, uh, and my name is manifestable. So if it's capable of being manifested, then it is manifestable. That's how it's just like, it's spelled in the dictionary. And, uh, and yeah, that's how you find me. My very first foray into uh BSV Bitcoin was, you know, just sending a DM in the dark to, uh, to Connor Murray, who I now is my colleague, you know, at the BSV association. And so I'm very thankful for that. Um, but yeah, uh, if, if you, it doesn't matter if you you know, heard about Bitcoin for the first time today, or whether you're an expert, um, you know, reach out to me and, uh, and build a bridge and, you know, we move forward together. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. I'm gonna end the recording there. <clears throat>